Now let me check my YouTube channel. Okay, now I'm getting good connection. It says excellent connection for me. Okay. And I'm gonna my remove. go live button is still grayed out. Why? I'm actually live already. <laughs> okay. I think. Well, hello. I think so. Is there any way to, ch to check? I guess everybody could tell me something on the chat if someone is seeing us talk about bullshit, right? Can someone say something on the chat if I'm live? I mean, I suppose I could just check from my end here. Yeah, no, we are live on your channel. Woo! Thank you, guys. Sorry, I really suck at making live streams. And <laughs> not only that, it is the stupid software I'm using, which is called Flatting Life. Well, All the stuff we are doing now for me, though. is better, OK? So it might crash at every single time. and. Uh, you know, you will just hear a bang. Everything will just break <laughs> at once. You're not live, Johnny? Just saying? No, no, I'm not live on my channel. Damn. What can we do about you, Johnny? What can we do about me? So if you reload your YouTube stuff, your YouTube... Yeah, let me just studio. try that. You see, you guys, how I suck at YouTube, right? I, I, all the time that people spend on you, YouTube... <laughs> I spend on performance optimization, that's why, right? Yeah, no, my go live button is still just grayed out. It just says connect streaming software to go live, but it shows excellent connection. Oh, here we go. That's a go live button. I think this is going to work. Are you live, Johnny? Ah, we are live on the Turbo Makes Games YouTube channel as well. All right. Awesome. So I guess we are ready to to start. Yeah. So this is the first time I'm going to use this software for streaming. I know that I should be maybe using something called Restreamer and such. And it's been I think it's like 20 bucks a month and I think it's possibly going to be worth all the hassle of setting us up this thing through Flatting Life. So if this ends up being okay, I'll stick to it. If it ends up sucking badly, you know, like now, <laughs> I will possibly just pay the 20 bucks a month. And of course, if you buy me a coffee, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll like probably, I, I feel like I might want to end up doing that soon because I definitely do want to uh, get back into the doing the live stream stuff. I know, you know, we have some cool things that we want to talk about. And there's uh, some other people that I've been chatting with that um, want to come on some some live streams, talk about some dot stuff. So uh, definitely excited, but yeah, it looks like we got some people in the chat. Good to see you, Luke, Big Fat Mama, Morvar. <laughs> Great to see y'all. Welcome in. Um, looks like, yeah, we are live on the Turbo Makes Games YouTube channel as well. Uh, of course, we are here with Ruben. He's live over on his channel, The Game Dev Guru. Go check him out. Give him a subscribe. I believe I do have a link down in the uh, description below where uh, you can go uh, subscribe to his channel. But yeah, welcome in, Ruben. What's going on? And you have done this introduction like at least 20 times, right? You, you sound so natural. <laughs> I think I sound like a, more like a robot, right? You, if you ever heard like this Lokendo TTS, right? The text to speech. I'm sure I sound more like that. How many you think times? I sound robotic? <laughs> I don't know. It's not natural. How many times will it take me to do this to get good at it, Johnny? From experience. Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's different for everybody. It's different for everybody. Some people get it like right off the rip and. You know, I've I've done, All I think right. I've done like I've done a ton of YouTube videos now. But anyways, we are here yeah, to. Let um, me actually introduce the say hi to the people that have my channel. Cheesy yeah. Cheesy, nice name. Reminds me of the cheese uh, strategies in StarCraft, which I used to <laughs> practice a lot myself. You know the cheese, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Also, Glenaru, Glenaru. I'm pretty bad at pronouncing nicknames, but yeah, welcome here. Uh, always use OBS for streaming. Yeah, the problem is that we normally have some problems with our internet providers. If you are living in Europe, any of you, or at least in Germany, be careful and not get a Vodafone. Because I actually made the mistake of taking Vodafone and you know I get problems with this every single time. Um, but Scotsman, awesome. LOD sounds like a great use case for dots. Yep, it's going to be... Uh, 
a special use case, I have to say, okay, about dots, okay? I can show you all the stuff that I've been doing for my client, obviously, or I would just, uh, you know, go uh, to jail. Probably some lawyer <laughs> who's just not at the door right now during Don't the live stream and jail. just point a gun <laughs> at my head. Uh, but we will see something uh, similar, right, uh, to what I had to do, right? Yeah, you'll, you'll um, end up going to court and uh, Phoenix Wright will be the lawyer of the, uh, <laughs> the other guy. Yeah, he did. Um, but okay, Dup, I think that's Jerome. I always forget about the nickname, nicknames. He's saying that you are such a pro. I guess that's a compliment, Johnny. So you should say You're a pro? You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are a pro. I'm a pro? Yeah. No, you're the pro here, man. <laughs> Um, you guys say, see some glitches or something on the video signal because on the preview of my channel, yeah, on, on my preview, I am seeing a little bit of glitches. Oh, it looks like we got Jason Story in here. <laughs> what is going hey, on? So that's why the internet is struggling. Maybe there are some glitches coming through. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna change the layout. The... And I promise if this ends up sucking so bad, I'm just gonna pay the 20 bucks a month for something like Restream. Uh, welcome Mario and welcome Ross Adams. I really know a few people here. Uh, by the way, I'm not making you small on purpose, Johnny. I'm just going to try if this layout works a bit better, but I think the glitch is still there, right? Not sure. Let's see. I should have yeah, three monitors, right? right? I was always like, why would I need three monitors? I have enough with one or even two, right? But yeah, now I, got, I, was I got three monitors. It's just the way to go, monitors. man. Okay, I put you back on the screen side to side. Let's see if it's better. Okay, guys, so let me explain what's cooking in the meantime. Uh, for yeah, this, yeah, you just yeah, absolutely. Need audio, right? You don't need to have uh, to see a pretty face. Of course, I'm talking about mine, not Johnny's. Uh, hey. <laughs> okay, so basically, um, I do a lot of consulting work for performance, right? And one of my clients had one interesting use case where they had to use custom codes uh, to disable and disable components, right? Depending on the distance. And for that, we could not use the LOD system from Unity because we needed more flexibility right, than just, you know, just say activate, deactivate this thing uh, depending on the distance, right? So we needed tons of flexibility. And of course, there's the, the usual approach in object-oriented programming would be to just, uh, you know, check the distance on every frame or whatever, you know, and depending on the distance, then you do something. Maybe activate or deactivate an object, like a game object, or you could just uh, disable a few components or do custom stuff, okay? That's the use case that I had. In our case, we had a hardware that's pretty sucky. I, I, I have it on the table. It's a HTC Flow, uh, which is you know like H, like a VR um, headset, uh, which is pretty okay. thin. It's very cool. Like and a because it's thin, one? yeah, uh, yeah, it's kind of standalone, but it barely has any battery. So you always have hmm. to be with a cable like this. Oh, and okay, I had like okay. a cable like this long or something, and I was always <laughs> testing like this. So I guess this is one of the reasons I ended up going to physiotherapy. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the chipset is pretty bad. I mean, it's okay, right? It's a, a Snapdragon XR1, whatever. It's a, a slow CPU. And uh, of course, I couldn't just do this 500 times per frame, right? In this case, we had like like 500 objects and I couldn't just be running this LOD, uh, manual LOD system, calculating distances and doing all of this sequentially. Of course, this is what we tried at the beginning, right? And this is actually something that we can uh, maybe do as well here on the live stream so that you guys get the context for what we are going to talk about. Yeah, no, right, and um, yeah, yeah, no. And just to kind of like give a little bit more context, yeah, you reached out to me and we're like, hey, you know, I think, uh, you know, I got this kind of system and there's, you know, I want to see if we can improve it by using like the job system or something like that. And, um, you know, we, we kind of uh, were talking a little bit and we figured that, you know, this might be a, a kind of an interesting you know, opportunity for us to do a little live stream to kind of show you, um, you know, one way that we can create like a simple little LOD system, basically using uh, dots. Um, and yeah, we can kind of like get into kind of all the the theory behind what we'll do and everything like that too. And um, yeah, just kind of walk you all through 
kind of what we're doing and maybe do a little bit of com performance comparisons and you know see actually how much performance that we can um, you know actually increase out of uh, this little implementation here. So yeah. Just for clarification, I will be acting like a dummy, okay? As if I was just coming from object-oriented programming and I had like very little idea about data-oriented programming. Now, partly this is true, partly this is true, <laughs> because I uh, have a lot. I have lost a lot of practice. You know, last year I spent three months making games for a AAA company, just dots. But then it came back after one and a half years, and I was like, "What was this? What is a variable? What is a component?" That, you know. But uh, what I want to say is that a big part of what we are going to talk about is me faking having little idea about all of this, right? And part of that will actually be true, right? The, so I would just try to be um, as useful as I can to you guys, right? To uh, get, to you when you have different levels of experience. In any case, feel free to drop questions on the chat. I will be harassing Johnny with a lot of questions. So <laughs> yeah, no, please do. I already do see one question here, and I can kind of start answering this as maybe you start uh, pulling your project up and everything like that. Um, but it comes from Delightful Games. Question, is LOD missing from DOTS completely, as in you have to develop it, it from scratch? Um, so yeah, basically, the like Unity's built-in LOD system is not going to work with DOTS. Um, basically, what we're going to be doing today is we're not actually developing off of like a base DOTS project. We're using um, like a base game object mono behavior type project. And then we're going to be kind of using dots to um, basically kind of like streamline some of the distance calculations for this LOD system um, so that we're not, you know, like processing all this stuff on, on the main thread, all single thread and everything like that. Um, so we're actually going to be using dots um, as kind of like basically we're going to have like kind of a, a companion entity simulation happening in the background where each game object kind of has an entity associated with it. And then um, kind of doing that, we can basically do these distance calculations for our LOD system and Johnny, then we can trigger. Yes. You dropped for a second or I dropped, oh. I don't know. Just repeat oh. the last sentence. Yeah, no, no. I was just saying that basically we're going to kind of end up having like a, a companion entity type simulation so that, um, you know, our, our game objects are each going to have an entity associated with them. And then the entities are actually going to be doing some more of those like, you know, complex, heavier distance calculations uh, where we can actually leverage the burst compiler as well as the C sharp job system. Um, and that will actually trigger whether we want to, you know, like enable or disable rendering on our specific game object um, renderer components. So that's kind of like a, a high level overview about, you know, what we're doing. And then we're going to, you know, just get into it a little bit more here. But uh, yeah, I do see that you are sharing your screen here, Ruben. So uh, why don't you give us a little rundown about the uh, the base project that you have us working with here. All right. Um, first, I would like to get some confirmation from someone that the quality is OK enough so that it is actually readable, what I'm showing. In fact, I'm going to show my dummy LOD system code um, just to not be, you know, uh, wasting your, your time as well, right? Can someone tell me if the quality is fine? Is it readable and such? It looks good on my end, but... <laughs> really? I only have like a small window like this, and of course I'm not going to be able to read anything from this this window. How can you well, say Well, I mean, it? It just, just what I'm receiving from the uh, the streaming software uh, from you. Like, it looks it looks good enough. I wish I could right. go full screen on this streaming software here, but... We can actually anyhow. go full screen, but then I have to remove our... Weapons. No, 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 I mean, I I mean just on my end. I just oh, yeah. mean on my end. Okay. Um, all that is good now that you're zoomed in. Perfect. So people are saying we are fine. Uh, it took a, a while for people to actually to, uh, to answer. I guess there's a huge delay or something like maybe. Yeah, there's a little, All right, so let's delay. get started. Uh, the background is really simple. Like I said, maybe if you're joining um, recently this stream, uh, I just need to create a custom LOD system, pretty simple, that just compares the distance and, you know, I can do something about this information, right? In this case, what I want to do is to disable the mesh renderer of these cubes, right? So for example, if I just had one cube, uh, let me see if I hit the jackpot. Yeah, I hit it, it is here. I just want to do something like this, right? 
I could give you more context about this if you want. Uh, for example, I can tell you that this, you know, in enabling or disabling the mesh render is much cheaper than activating or deactivating the entire object. I can also tell you things like um, it is not enough to go to this cube and say, I'm going to move it to a layer that it's actually not rendered. For example, I don't know, uh, water. Right? Uh, I could just go to the camera and I could think if I didn't know Unity, I could think that if I don't render uh, to the to this calling mask, right? This is fine. No, it is not. You're still paying a huge price for this. I have to say, I've done a lot of testing. Okay, I know why this is you, the case. You are the performance guru. Yes, thank the you, Johnny. Dev guru. It's good to have someone <laughs> remind me this uh, from time to time. Uh, also, it is not enough to call the force rendering flag or force rendering off flag uh, to set it to false either it still has a lot of overhead right uh, for example i could just go here and say uh, force rendering off and say true you know? and you could think that it has no overhead anymore in terms of rendering but it is not the case either okay mm. uh, that still has a huge impact on the cooling part okay infrastructure cooling but yeah not uh, to speak about that because uh, yeah, we would go to, into a different discussion. What I want to do, again, Johnny, is to disable this damn mesh renderer depending on the distance, just like this, like a click and click, all right? So what I would do if I had little idea about this and I didn't know Johnny, or I didn't have a Johnny in my life, would be to do something like, okay, so this is my mesh. Uh, just let me know if I do something wrong, okay, Johnny? And I want to compare it to a specific point, right? In this case, it could be, um, let's call this reference point, this transform. And I'm just going to hard code it to the camera, right? So I'm going to do camera main transform. Transform. Uh, it's always better to reference uh, or to cache exactly what you need. Okay, so if you yeah. need a transform, always cache the, the transform. Do not cache the camera unless you actually need it, okay? Because accessing the transform is expensive. So if I had this reference point, I could just do something like if vector three distance, at this reference point position to this transform position is bigger than I'm just going to hard code it for now. Then when, then I do something, right? And actually, I can do a bit better. And I can just create a Boolean that is like, I don't know, uh, too far away. OK? So it's the case. It's far away. Then I have to disable that and so on, so on, so on. So, on. so mesh renderer enabled is not too far away, right? It should be pretty simple. Did I do it right, Johnny? Anything to say about my code? No, that seems like fine. Uh, you know, again, very basic, simple implementation. And um, yeah, again, that's kind of you know what we're doing today is we're just doing like a real simple implementation here. Of course, you can get you know a lot more complex with these LOD systems, but um, yeah, you know, we're just kind of doing you know it's like oh. some some basic theory here. And uh, you know, depending on how much time we have, you know, I think there are a couple cool little optimizations that we could make that would be fun. But um, yeah, no, looks looks good so far. Yeah, we start with the, the problems, uh, Johnny. In this case, it's Unity, been a bit stupid. Sharing violation <laughs> on path. What, what did they do with wrong, wrong now? Right? What is that all about? I don't know. Just let me restart Unity. This is always fix that. Uh oh, I need to hide. The projects I'm working on. <laughs> it's set for a frame, right? No worries. That's just the name of the projects. No one is going ever to sue me, right? Hopefully. And actually, if someone knocks at the door, let me know in the chat or something, because I have kind of noise isolating uh, headphones, so I will not hear it. Don't you a popular guy? People come into your house all the mm -hmm. time. <laughs> no, never happened, but you never know. You cannot ever be too safe. So people are telling me, can you use the square distance? Uh, oh, Jesus. Instead, of course, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that we can. Yep. Do. I'm not yep. going to focus so much on this type of theme sessions, but indeed, that would be the way. To and go. Yeah, actually, there's there's a cool little trick that we can do with ECS that, um, 
kind of goes alongside that. So that's that's something that you know, if we have a little bit of time, we might be able to add in. Oh, you have more errors now. Great. <laughs> I don't even know if I've ever seen that system IO exception sharing violation. Wait, don't we have Jason's story on the on the live stream? He's a pro in unity. Come on, Jason, help us. Okay, now let's see. Um, if you clear out the console, I mean, what sticks? Yeah, yeah that doesn't work. I will just oh. try to maybe clear the stupid library folder now. That's always the next step. Well, is it still compiling or something? Oh, yeah. No, it was not, I think. And if it was, anyway, I closed All it. All right. Away. Well, I guess, um, yeah, while you figure that out, maybe you could just like, you don't have to share your screen. We can just kind of talk a little bit about the, talk a little bit more about the theory of the, the uh, optimizations that we're going to be making here, if you want to. Let's do that. Um, just so you you can stop sharing your screen if yeah, you want, yeah, so you're not not doxing I'm yourself. <laughs> but um, yeah, so basically, kind of like um, I was talking about a little bit. Well, I think Ruben is just showing your screen right now, at least on my end. This is actually not me anymore. This is the stupid software I'm speaking about. Yeah. Oh, it says I'm hidden. <laughs> Don't worry. I get it. Okay. Okay. I think we're good now. All right. It's just me. Hello. Um, so, yeah, basically, kind of the theory behind what. No worries. Keep talking. Okay. Fix this. We're good. We're good. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, again, kind of the theory that we're going to be doing is basically we have this game object project that. Uh, Ruben was just showing off here. And again, we're kind of doing a, a very simple LOD system where, you know, everything within or past a certain distance from the camera is just going to have its its renderer disabled. Um, it's still going to be, you know, essentially part of the simulation. So if it was, you know, moving around, it could be you know, still doing all those sorts of things. And if it, you know, comes within range, then the mesh renderer would be enabled. So again, just a, you know, very simple LOD system here. Basically, what we're going to be doing is um, going to be using the ECS entity component system to create uh, basically a companion entity for each game object. So we're going to have just like a little a little script on each of these game objects that when it gets spawned in the world, it's going to get uh, go ahead and create an entity that is associated with it. Now, this entity is going to have um, basically kind of like some references to the original base game object. And we're going to be using some built-in systems that, um, by the way, I am getting a warning on uh, my live stream saying that the bit rate is a little low. So um, hope everything is all good. But um, anyways, um, basically what we're going to be doing is um, the, the entity, the companion entity is going to get its position from the game object, basically using a kind of like built-in thing to... Uh, Unity dots. Basically, there is this um, component that we can add to an entity, which is copy transform from game object. And then we basically just have a reference to the original game object transform. And then there is a built in system in the ECS transformation systems that automatically, you know, essentially copy the values from the game object to that companion entity. Now, the reason we want that is this companion entity is really not going to have much associated with it. It's basically just going to have the you know ECS equivalent of a transform component, which we'll get into. Um, so it just kind of knows physically where it is in the world. And that's about it as far as just kind of like basically what's on that entity. Now, using that information, we can kind of do our you know distance checks with the um, the the entity itself and you know the main camera or the target point or you know whatever we want our lod system to run based off of and then you know using uh ecs we're going to be creating a job which is going to allow us to basically do some multi-threading and take advantage of the burst compiler uh to make to to do these distance calculations much more efficiently um and then basically based off of whatever we find through those distance calculations, we're just going to um, add or remove some components to basically just tag empty components to these entities. And then uh, we're gonna have a follow-on system that basically runs on everything with these you know, special tags. 
Um, and then that will actually trigger the enabling and disabling of the renderer. Now, the reason we actually do this in a separate system is because we're when we reference things on the game object, um, such as like the mesh renderer, just to enable it or disable it, uh, we have to do this all single threaded without the burst compiler. So the reason you know we want to do that in a separate system is so we can do the you know distance calculations all multi-threaded with the burst compiler and all that. And then we'll have that follow on system that basically just, you know, comes through and says, you know, hey, is there anything that needs to change its renderer state? Um, and then we'll just go ahead and run that enable or disable. So um, that's that's basically the, you know, the 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 long and short of what we're going to be doing here today. But um, how does that sound, Ruben? You got any questions on it so far? Can you repeat what you said? <laughs> I'm joking. What's a companion? Rewind the stream. What's a companion uh, entity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a companion entity um, basically is just like, so a, an entity is is kind of like a game object. You can kind of think of it in that some kind of sense um, where it's basically just something that associates, you know, a number of components with it. Um, in this case, we're just having an entity again with basically just a transform component. So it kind of, you know, knows where it, it physically lives in the world, although it doesn't, again, have any renderer components or anything like that. And then um, I call this the companion entity just because every game object that we're going to be running this LOD system against is going to have one of these entities associated with it. Um, so that basically is, um, again, yeah, just kind of a, a companion representation, as you will. So does that kind of answer your question? Uh, of course, man, of course. I mean, I mean, what else can I say without looking stupid? So people in my channel, they're saying that you make it sound so easy. Hey, I'm glad to read this because that means that we, uh, you know, we might be able to teach you guys a lot, right? Uh, we might be able to learn a lot, right? Yeah. If that sounds no, I, easy, I think... but it's not, well, uh, <laughs> we are going to address right now. This, yeah, uh, no, I, you know. I think with... Uh dots like once you kind of like understand the theory and like how to think in a data oriented way like it is easy um like again as far as the theory goes now the implementation of it is not always easy especially because we are working with like experimental unity packages here and um you know weird things go wrong um and yeah i've, I've been encountering some random bugs with uh, some of the projects that i've been working on lately but um you know that's that's all part of the all part of the game but um yeah, I, I think when you do kind of get the the theory, like you can just, you know, break it down because it's literally just, you know, just data that you're looking at. And, um, you know, when you when you kind of like figure out how to like actually best use a data oriented paradigm, um, like it just kind of, yeah, makes sense. It's just all about the data, right? Johnny, it's before we data, start, baby. one important question. Please. How do I get one of the the T-shirts that you have, man? <laughs> you only um, you printed just one or something this, or is, you... this is a one-off <laughs> <laughs> i i bought this for gdc because i was going to be on the uh unity's live stream so i got this and then i got another uh a long sleeve one that's um, nice cool nice, it's, nice, it's nice. blue and it's it's just white so it's not like colored logo or anything like that i cannot imagine what's behind that t-shirt is it also a tattoo or something in your chest is it or what? something about it is it maybe a, a tattoo as well or something yeah, I have a performance by default tatted across my chest. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All I'm right, kidding, let I'm me kidding. try to share the screen without cool. things going. By the way, welcome wrong. in your eye. Great to see you in the chat here. Wait, your eye is in your channel. It's not on mine. Yeah, your eye. I thought we were friends. No, he's more friends with me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we should be seeing soon again the screen sharing. All right, just a bit of patience. So it's activated. Did you get your errors cleared up? Uh, yes, I just had to delete it just deleting the library, the library folder. folder and wait. I mean, it's good that you talked for so long because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know how, I know sometime. how Unity can be sometimes for sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you guys should be seeing my screen. And uh, now oh, that's there are weird. No I can more... see it on the stream, but I can't see it on the the um, our thing here. I think we're fine, Johnny. Let's yeah. put some courage. We'll okay. So basically, the code is kind of the same. I just 
change this distance to 10 meters, right? And yes, we can do the distance square and such, which is important. But sometimes in my experience, it is also very important to know that we are calling the same thing 500 times. And just the context switching, right? Of uh, loading one specific object into the stack frame and all of these things is just going sometimes to be more expensive than the just the square root calculation, okay? That's been my experience uh, often enough. So people tend to focus a lot on ALU optimization, right? The arithmetic logic unit type of operations. But uh, very often, you know, a big part of this cost is also just coming from just loading stuff into your uh, cache, right, of the CPU. So if you're just switching between objects or scripts or components, a big part of this price is going to be exactly that, right? Especially if you're using the update function where Unity has to call it for you, right? It's calling, it's doing the call from C++, and this cost, uh, this is an expensive cost, right? This transition from the C++ world, where Unity knows everything about your stuff, to the C-sharp uh, world, which is your world, right? So here we have the cubes. I'm just going to uh, lift them here and take one cube and put it at zero, zero, zero. And at some point, I can just move this cube and it's going to be looking good until I get far away from that. And, uh, you know, beyond 10 meters, then we get what I accomplished, what, what I wanted to accomplish, right? To disable that mesh renderer. So in theory, I would think that I'm done, right? And if I actually build this game, uh, game, it's kind of an exaggerated term for this, right? <laughs> but if <laughs> at some point I build this and I deploy this on the device, you will see that it's not cool, right? So reason for this is we have tons of these objects, right? So every time that Unity calls this update function, it does it from C++. And that has a cost, right? So for every entity that you have, well, I think I'm using the word entity too early. For every one of the <laughs> that you have, it's going to call it from C++. That's going to have a big cost overhead. One thing you could do about this is to aggregate your update functions in what I call the batch update manager, uh, which is one of the scripts that I have. Uh, I think it's called CPU slicing. So basically, I just uh, rename this to batch update. So Unit is not going to call this, right? And then I just create an aggregator that has one update and calls this batch updates uh, together. If you have questions about this, just let me know. I can just put a link to a blog post where I explain this. That would make things easier. But still, every time I call the update function, I would need um, the CPU to load information about the instance or the object of this component, right? And that's also going to take quite some time. And after that, of course, we are calculating distances, right? So we need to access the position of the reference point, which is a transform. And for this, we also do some calculations. And again, I need to access this my transform to make this kind of position calculation, right? And at the end of the day, this distance, distance is not going to cost you that much compared to all the memory uh, operations that we are doing, right? Because if we are targeting mobile, especially memory is a big problem. Uh, it usually generates a lot of uh, bottlenecks. Memory is expensive, memory bandwidth, okay? Memory capacity is not such a big problem anymore, but memory bandwidth is expensive, so. Yeah. And actually, yeah, before we go any further, um, would we be able to get some like performance metrics of just kind of like your your base implementation? And then um, I don't know if you have this uh, kind of uh, aggregate update method working as well. Uh, no, I didn't do it. Right? I mean, I could do it, but we can just. That's fine. The... But you have that that base one still working, right? The. Um, uh, yeah, just one. like the, the one that you just made. Should still work. Just where, where everyone has their own update method. Actually, I can already give you a tip on this, guys. I have a super OP CPU. Still very slow for Unity standards because I always have to wait <laughs> one stupid minute for Unity to recompile everything. But still, it's a quite fast computer, right? It's uh, one of the Ryzen with 32 cores, whatever. So sometimes you will see that even if you do millions of operations, this is still going to be very fast, right? 
Uh, let me see if actually I can find this somewhere should be in behavior updates. And here we have the cost of my script, right? Which is going to be 0 0.3 milliseconds, which is huge if we were doing this in VR, okay, in mobile, but we are not, okay, we are safe. I mean, in the case of my client, it's actually VR, but anyway, in this case, we are fine. 0 0.3 milliseconds, substantial, okay? It is substantial when you are targeting 70 plus FPS. And this is the cost, right? So if I clicked on this window, I would see my dummy LOD system update is taking this distance 0 0.005. In total, it's taking 0 0.2, right? However, you will see that the whole behavior update is taking longer than that, right? It's taking 0 0.28. And part of this is because of these gaps, right? You see these gaps. So I do not know exactly why there is a gap because it is a gap, but my obvious suspicion about this is Unity taking time to call your different update functions from C++. So that's one type of overhead that I was talking about before that would explain partly why we have this gap, right? And other than that, uh, I don't know, there, there are some other things that uh, I, I, I might, you know, think about when it comes to this gap, but so far it is this. Normally it could also be that you are just lacking um, you know, to add some baking profiling from the, some, the profiling API and such, but this is not the case. Okay? This is Unity being slow. So there we go. We have 0 0.28, and this is the case for 100 objects. Actually, this is quite expensive, I have to say. For yeah, I, was gonna say, I thought this was like with a thousand, objects. but. <laughs> okay, we have a question, by the way. So Zero. can I ask? what technique you used to determine the cost of the other techniques, like putting an object on a specific layer you mentioned and not rendering it by the camera. Oof. Maybe I can show you the projects where I did these measures, okay? Um, and actually that will be a really good lesson by itself because I use a lot of the APIs that people do not use and to actually measure these things, right? Uh, things that I already talked about in the performance task force, but I'm not going to promote anything, okay? So just focus on this project or focus on the project. I will, we will come back to that later, okay? You need for, forget do you, do you have the name. ability to uh, spawn more cubes in this project? I just kind of want to get some like yeah. good performance metrics before we uh, actually kind of do our companion optimization just to kind of see, get kind of like a baseline with the game objects and then we'll do our, um, you know, kind of, implementations and um yeah see, I just see want my computer at. to crash man <laughs> oh wait oh, okay it's not recording Whew. okay so let's see so do we see blue colors so that's already meaningful right just got to behavior updates and i have no idea why i have a 0 0.2 millisecond gap there i think it's exaggerated but yeah, we can. Is that still that. with uh, about a hundred game objects? No, no, this is worth with one thousand. Okay. Okay. And honestly, you know, you can always make up for a performance bottleneck by adding thousands and thousands, and you can always say, okay, yeah, but that's not real life. But actually, it is. Okay. In, my, in the case of my client, we had about five hundred objects, and a similar process was taking about four milliseconds. So that is. Meaningful, okay? 500 entities yeah, yeah, or objects totally. is not uh, something like, you know, just an, a practice exercise, right? To justify dots or something. No, no, it's actually real stuff. It's real meat. So with 1000, it is 1.40, okay? In this case. Okay. And I'm not going to go further than that because it's going to just bring down my stream and we are going to mess it up, okay? I think 100 Fair enough. is actually enough for now. <clears throat> we can wrap it up later. So this is the Nubi-like implementation. Uh, you know, I would possibly think about when it comes to doing a custom LOD system, right? Yeah. E maybe like 50 years ago, okay? Not, not nowadays, 50, 50 years, years ago. ago. <laughs> 
Okay, Johnny, oh, do your magic. LEDs. What do we do Boom. here? Let us get into it. All right, so uh, first thing I should point out that you already did is you already have imported the uh, entities package uh, just by going to your package manager, um, adding a package from the Git URL from com.unity.entities. Of course, if you're not familiar with the process, I do have um, a few videos on my channel going over kind of how to do that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to point out that you do already have the entities packages in your game, so we can start uh, making some dot stuff right away. Uh, so I think probably the best place for us to start is to be, um, you know, create our kind of companion entities here. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to create um, a script that will go on each of these game objects. And then um, what that's going to do is it's basically just going to spawn the companion entity and get it all set up. So I'm going to have you go ahead and create a new mono behavior script. And I still can't see my your screen, so um, we're gonna be. Uh, Maybe you can just go to my or your YouTube channel, uh, watch yeah, it. Yeah, I guess I can do that. Were... There's gonna be a little bit of a delay, but um... muted. Oh right, okay. Not sure if I have a better solution. Maybe you can just share it on Discord. Can I call you on Discord? Do you have your permission? Um, that might mess with the stream a little bit maybe if you just like try stop sharing your screen and start it again because i think that's what happened that that'll kick it into gear okay you mean in flat in life right yes okay. let's do that so i am sharing this again I'm trying, Johnny, I know. Just wait one second. This software is pretty bad. <laughs> what? The three things together now? Okay. Uh, oh, is there, uh, is there? I don't know. It's loading. Um, it's black. Is it? Should actually be working now. Yep. Looks good on my side. Not on yours? Oh. No, it just shows both of us um like it it's the same as what's live on the stream right now but your screen is just black oh that's okay all right i'll just pull up your your stream and just kind of deal with the delay here uh we have another problem johnny we have the problem back of the sharing violation on path oh no <laughs> yes it's back so Ruben, maybe what, what i'm just do? gonna do is to remove the temp stuff i'm not going to delete the whole library bullshit this really pisses me off man okay an unexpected error is keeping you from deleting this folder okay so it might oh, it's actually not here anymore of course you need to delete it let's start it again Okay, so Johnny, in the meantime, I'm going to use the time to ask you questions. So we are going to create a companion entity, right? Yes. And yes. you say we call this companion, or rather you call this companion because, by the way, guys, I hope that you like my background. Dressables, unleash undressables, addressables. So we call this companion because it's going to be holding hands with the cubes, correct? Just going to be just together with the cubes, but it's going to be living in the entity world, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So still unit is complaining. Yeah, and so I guess um, I can kind of give a, a little <laughs> high level overview on kind of what our next steps are here. But um, so yeah, basically we're gonna be creating a mono behavior that's going to go on every single one of these um, cubes that we have in our world and then on start then we're basically just going to use the entity manager to um, essentially just create this new companion entity we're just like creating a, a, a new entity from scratch giving it all the required components that it's going to need and then um and then we're actually going to go ahead and make that link between the game object and the entity uh, which is actually really easy to do it's like literally like three lines of code um but yeah, I mean, if you're not like familiar with the entity manager, basically it's just kind of um, a nice 
call it like a, a tool that we have that and each one of these entity managers lives within a separate world on the ECS side. And it allows us to do some basic operations against our entities. So we can, you know, create these entities from scratch. We can add components to them, remove components from them. Um, so it, it, it is pretty handy. Um, you know, if we were, um, it, it does come at a little bit of a cost because, you know, some of these operations, especially for making structural changes where we're, you know, spawning entities, adding, removing components and so on, um, those do take a little bit of a performance hit. So there are some ways um, to kind of optimize like when we're inside um, like a, an update loop that we might want to like queue up a bunch of those operations using something like an entity command buffer um, that still ends up using an entity manager kind of down the line to do all those operations. Um, but the the benefit of doing an entity command buffer is we're kind of queuing up all those operations to run them at once rather than you know running them all over the place. Now, for this case, it's totally fine that we use the entity manager um, just because we're just doing this once on startup and it you know doesn't really matter that it takes a little bit long at the beginning. But um, yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, jump Working into this Working after reopening the project twice, okay? Just think about <laughs> that next time should be super obvious. Just open it twice, okay? Yes. You restart Unity once, it doesn't work. Try yeah. it again. Anyway, um, so are you okay with the name of cube companion entity? Or, I mean, cube is my use case, but it could also just be- That, that know, sounds like great to me. Character companion entity to make it less obvious, more obvious actually. So yeah. I'm going to uh, rename this in the script as well, because we do not want to upset Unity not anymore. It's been really traumatic already. <laughs> okay, so this is my entity. And I assume we need to change something here, right? Does it need to be a structure? Uh, no, no, this is so this is again, right. this is the mono behavior that we're going to be attaching to our game object. And then here, okay. it's going to uh, actually spawn the uh, the entity here. Okay, wait right. one second. I have one question here. And yep. if this is something that we are going to attach to our objects or game object, then shouldn't it be called rather like an ordering script? So that is a good question. And this Thank isn't you. necessarily an authoring script. An authoring script, I mean, you could call it an authoring script if you wanted, but an authoring script are typically going to be attached to game objects that will be converted to entities. And then the okay. authoring script is basically a mono behavior um, okay. that's going to create either one component or any number of components and add it to that game object that it's on during yep. the conversion process. So, yeah. Okay. Then the only thing I have to say about this is that I might be a bit confused when I read this, uh, when if I read this in the feature, because when I see in the file name something like entity, I would expect that to be the entity, but entities, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't sound like, you know, they should have a mono behavior on the inside. Uh, this is still uh, a good name, you think, right? Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, it, for, for these purposes, it's fine. Yeah, we're kind of splitting hairs on <laughs> the namings of things. So, I mean, yeah. it's, um, you know, just whatever makes sense for your project. But yeah, I think th this is fine. What do we um, do Yep. So anyways, we can start um, just in the awake function here. And um, we're going to go ahead. And first thing that we're going to need is actually a reference to that entity manager. So you can just do um, inside the awake, just do a var entity manager. Um, and then we'll set this equal to. And again, there's a little bit of a delay. So if I'm going too fast, just uh, just let me know to, to slow down a little bit. But yes, yeah, so you'll say the var entity manager equal to um, do go to the world class. So that's capital W world uh, dot default game object injection world. Wait, wait, wait. You are too fast. Yep. Um, so equals? Equals world with a capital world. W because we want to uh, get the, the world class, which and is the from the one? entities library uh, dot default yep. game object injection world. You got that? What a mouthful. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So um, the, 
so the default game object injection world, this is basically it. Yeah, it is. It is completely a mouthful, but it's basically like the default world on the ECS side. Um, uh, that, that's basically just the easiest way to put that for now. Um, and then do dot entity manager. And that's how we can yep. actually get the entity manager off that. All right. Sweet. I have it. All right. So now we'll actually go ahead and create our companion entity. So um, you know, just go down to the next line and we'll do a uh, var companion entity. And so this is actually going to be of type entity, if you're curious. And then we'll set this I'm equal. Curious. Oh, good. Um, and we'll set this equal to uh, your entity manager, which looks like you just called it EM. So you do a em dot create entity, and then in here we can basically pass in the components that we want to be part of our entity, essentially by default here. And so basically, there there are a couple of ways to do this. Easiest way to do this is to just do um, like the the type of keyword, and then we'll pass in just the type of the different components that we want. So we're just going to need three components here to start. So uh, the first one that we're going to want is a what is known as a local to world component. So that's uh, local to world, all one word, capitals on L T and W. Basically, this kind of is sort of like the the end all be all of like where an entity lives within the game, uh, the game world. It, it basically tells the rendering engine where to actually render that entity. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of uh, important to have that. Um, but it also we also have kind of like a number of components that factor into the calculation of the local to world components. So those would be the translation, the rotation, and the scale. So this local to world component, it's a float four by four matrix. And um, basically from that local to world, we can kind of derive the position, orientation, scale, and all that. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, um, yeah, so, so basically we'll also need to add a translation component to that entity. So after the local to world uh, parentheses ends, uh, just go ahead and do a comma and then do another type of translation. And we need this because the basically the copy transform from game object system that we're going to be again tapping into is going to write to that translation component. And then after that, there's another built in system that takes what's in that translation component and it writes it to the local to world component and then the local to world component you know basically tells the the entity where to render in this case again we're not rendering into anything but it is still important for us to have that yep. local to world component or else everything breaks to have some sort of uh, representation in the world right when it comes at least at least to the position and such exactly. even if it's not visible something that i found very useful um when i was playing around with dots back then was actually to use writer because it made it super easy to just to inspect uh, what actually these yeah, yeah, yeah. things are, right? That, that's, that's one of the great things about uh, ECS is just like, it's basically open source. So you can just kind of, you know, F12 into a bunch of the things that they have, check out the source code. It's been super helpful for me, um, just yep. kind of like figuring out how things work, and, you know, kind of learning how other things are set up so I can, you know, set similar things up in my own code here. Yeah, exactly. For example, if I didn't have the lag to have you here on this stream, uh, and I would be wondering what's local to world, right? I could just click here, yeah. right? Or in my case, yeah. it's control click. And I said, okay, so this is a component. It is a structure. So it's just about holding data. This is the matrix that you were talking about, I assume. Yep. And then we just have some operations or just functions that, you know, uh, they're, they're actually shortcuts. properties. So we can basically, yeah. So it's, it's kind of similar to doing like a, a transform dot forward. Um, yep. So you can just get the, you know, forward direction off it. So yeah, definitely handy stuff to have. And then again, you can get the position and rotation from it. So. Yep. And yeah. for the translation seems to be pretty straightforward. It's a float three value, right? Indeed. So, what else do we have here? Okay, so yeah, we just need to add one other thing to our companion entity, and that's actually going to be the, um, so we'll do another type of, and then this is the copy transform from game object. 
Now, this is basically just a tag component, so there's no uh, data associated with it. I don't think there's any data associated with it. Actually, you can right. uh, sure. probably F12 into that but one. This and just time, sure and only just this confirm time. my sanity here that it's a it's an empty <laughs> uh, component there. Yeah, this is interesting because, for example, when I was working on this other game, um, if you had a tag, we actually put the tag uh, word as a yeah as at a, the end. You know, yeah, that that's typically what I do as well. Okay. But yeah, okay. Um, empty structure, so I guess that it will be used by some sort of system, right? Uh, at some Correct. point. Okay. So yeah, again, again, we're kind of using this to tap into a built-in system that automatically copies the um, the the game objects transform over to the entity's translation component. So um, those are basically all the essentially ECS components that we need to add to our entity. So you can just, you know, close off that line of code there. Um, <clears throat> and then, so right now there is one thing missing and that's, we actually do not have a link between our companion entity and our game object. Now, basically the way that we're going to do this is again, we're going to use our entity manager. So you can just do a EM. Yes, one question. This one Please. question. When you say yep. that, it is because I, I I'm telling Unity or the ECS system. Please copy the transform transform from this game object, right? But I'm yes. not actually telling it from which actual Correct. game object. Yes. Right? You you don't know where you're copying from. Yeah. So like you just have that tag. Nothing's gonna happen. It's just gonna. The, the system won't even run because it doesn't have the next necessary component that we're going okay. to be adding um that basically allows us to point to the transform that we want to copy from so if i run this i would possibly get a debug like a warning log or something saying uh ruben no, stupid, no, right? no that's that's <laughs> that's the great thing about dots is it's just not it's, the system's not even going to run so you won't even know that <laughs> it's it's not no happening. one would call me stupid right unity wouldn't exactly. say Okay. Exactly. So what? How do we do the, this? The tag then? component's an empty component, so it doesn't add any memory cost anyway. So it's mm -hmm. uh, zero overhead. Uh, but yeah. Anyhow, so we actually the next thing that we need to do is basically we need to add essentially a reference um, to the translation component that we're going to be mirroring. Um, you know, again from our game object to our entity. So basically, the way that we do that is um, we have to use this kind of built-in. Uh, method off the entity manager. So we'll do a em dot. And this is add component object. So whoa, um, whoa, whoa. slow yeah. it down, baby. I'm asking you to add component. Add component object. Oh, yeah. So, okay, add... so object sounds like an object. So reference type, right? I assume Correct. that this goes so, yes. along add, this line. Add component is going to be like adding an ECS component that's, you know, just, you know, data only. It's, you know, limited to uh, all the restrictions for uh, regular ECS components, whereas the add component object, that's going to be um, essentially a reference type. Now, again, when we're using these reference types, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, utilize the burst compiler and um, um, you know have to run everything on the main thread. So there are definitely some limitations with using these component objects. Um, so definitely just you know be aware that there is going to be a little bit of performance overhead uh, by using these. Who cares about performance, Johnny? Come on, let's go. Let's, uh, let's get this done. Do. This that, is that, going to that, work. That's literally your business, Ruben. <laughs> OK, so add component objects. I guess that yep. I have to tell it, OK, I want to Correct, add you'll pass an object. The companion entity. The companion and entity. then, yes, the, the object you're going to be adding is um, just the transform component off this mono behavior, because again, we're going to be um, you know, attaching this mono behavior to our game object um okay and yeah we want to, to reference that so just do you know lowercase t transform yeah i have a question here uh johnny um as a person who's not super experienced with dots and uh, this add component object so i'm asking the entity manager of this specific world to mm -hmm. add a reference to the transform of this game object all clear into this companion entity that's correct what, but if I'm thinking about variables and object-oriented programming, uh, what's the name of this variable, or what's the name of this, you know, thing that I'm going to put it there? Because what happens if I do it like three times, right? Um, how I'm going to 
be able to tell off between the different objects that I'm adding, right? I mean, of course, this could be transform one, transform two, transform three. Uh, what happens if I did something like this, right? How can I tell them apart? Because this entity would have like three transforms in this case. So I don't think it will actually let you do that. I've actually never tried with component objects. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, try that. See what happens. Go back over to Unity, see if it yells at you. Uh, when you oh, oh, man, I, I don't want to upset Unity, man. I learned the lesson <laughs> before with the, all these things. I mean, I can try it. Okay. But maybe I was, you know, asking if you knew about that out of uh, nowhere, right? Uh, because for me, it's like I'm adding a type transform and an actual reference to a transform. But yeah, so, I so again, more, yeah, right? I, I don't think it will let you do that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know it won't let you do that with um, like ECS component types um you can't add like multiple ones of the same type to an entity ah, okay. so I, I think that same restriction is going to apply for component objects um okay. but uh I, I don't think i've actually ever tried that so so basically what we could say about this is that we are expected to give it uh you know to give only one reference um to this entity of one specific type right okay yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. All clear. Cool. So, yeah, we now have, um, that's basically what we need to set up our companion uh, entity here. So, I mean, let's just go back to Unity. Go ahead and, uh, you know, drop this component onto your prefab. Yep. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not going to drag it. Just going to click here, add component. Uh, what was the companion, right? Yep. Character companion so, entity is what you call it. Yeah. It here on my prefab. I'm going to set the spawner to spawn only one. I don't. I prefer to see one blue screen rather than 100 blue screens. And <laughs> actually, uh, is there any reason that I should do this on awake and not on a start? This would be like another question that would pop into my head. Okay. Um, common practice. I I would just prefer to do it in a wake just because I would want to have that set up before everything. And then maybe if there's anything that you would need to do um like in, in start or on like the first update or something like that, then um that'll be, be taken okay. care of. You really have it set up by then. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I have the spawner. That's going to spawn one of these cubes or characters, and this has my original LOD system that was taking, let's say, one millisecond for one thousand objects. Too expensive. And now it has the new character companion entity that we just created, which just creates an entity, right? And this entity is going to have these components, the usual ones that you see everywhere, translation, local to world and such, but it's also going to have a tag called copy transform from game object, plus a reference to the transform itself, because otherwise the system that takes care of this copy transform from game object is just going to tell me, what the fuck are you trying, man? <laughs> is that correct? Is that a good summary? That, that sounds beautiful to me. Okay, so, um, what do I do now? Uh, should I just play it and see that nothing happens? Um, so yeah, that's actually what I was going to say. I was, I was looking up one quick thing here. And, uh, um, let's do... um, so yeah, actually what we can do below that uh, add component object, this would just be something kind of easy for uh, debugging here. Sure. Uh, and by the way, that. there's a question. Uh, what happens if the game object is destroyed? Do you need to clean up the entity reference? I will. I, I know what to say, but I will the expert say that. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's not going to automatically destroy the um, the uh, the entity, and the, it'll still be kind of living in the ECS world. Um, so yeah, that that is something that you would we would want to kind of clean up. So we could probably. Um, you know, if we want to make that companion entity a class scope variable and then just, you know, on destroy, we can just go ahead and, and destroy the entity. But we can we can uh, do that later. And I assume that normally it's fine to leave it to, to let it live, I guess, in the world and such. But what I would wonder is 
if we destroy the original object or game object, then this reference or this object that we assigned uh, or added into this entity would be broken, right? Like broken for good, because this game object will be destroyed. Therefore, there should be no transform, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah. In this yeah, case, you could be probably get some errors accessing that. Um, but yeah, so the the only thing that I wanted to do right now is just do an em dot set name and then we can just kind of name um and you can just pass in the companion entity and then just put in a string of of companion entity just so we can kind of see that in our uh is this acceptable for you debug window. um stream is <laughs> a little bit behind so i can't see but right. i would assume um, it is just fine i'm sorry it's i had to, EM, I had to tell name you the entity itself so it's going to be the companion yes, entity in. and then give it a name um is it a good practice actually to maybe just pass the name of the game object or something because i guess i will end up with thousands of them so should it be like individual per entity something that I yeah i mean saw? you can you can call it like um you know you can do like you know string interpolation if you want and say like you know yes. game object name plus companion or something Oh, cool. So I'm just going to set the name or something. I don't know. Possibly it doesn't look good or sexy, but I don't care. Yeah, so, that's, that's totally fine. I never use the set name, but I hope that you show me uh, it's actual magic soon. I will. I will. Uh, so yeah, hop back over to Unity. Yep. And um, let's see, you do have this object on your, your basically cube prefab, right? Or the uh, you, you do have the 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 script on your um, key prefab. In my prefab, yeah, it's in the prefab. Yeah, cool. All right, so um, we will get you the um, dots hierarchy window. So if you go up to window, yep, and dots and hierarchy. Dude, that's new for me. I only use this this simple window under analysis. Entity debugger. Yeah, you did the entity debugger. Yep. Which is yep. good. So this is this is a new one as of Ooh. as of uh, entity 0 0.50. So it is it is, yeah. I have a whole so, video on my channel going over the new editor windows and and they're all awesome. So yeah, you guys should should subscribe to his channel. Uh, <laughs> totally uh, it's sense. worth your time. So I actually uh, started listening to your videos while I write on the motorcycle, right? I do not uh. watch. Because uh, you know that would be illegal and dangerous, but I always hear you know, like, get to your destination safely everything. and learn about dots there. <laughs> yeah. So which option was it under dots? Uh, hierarchy. All right. There it is. So, okay. And then it, it just shows basically nothing right now, right? It says no world available. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, so hit the play mode. What do you actually dock? the dots hierarchy just to know what looks better you know in terms of organization how do you do it before? um so i actually have it as another tab on my regular hierarchy and i just flip back and forth between the two let's do it like that so hit the play button yeah, works. do you mind answering a question that i just Here. saw in the chat so okay. if new objects are instantiated will it still work will they be able to register with ecs in real time while the game is already running yep absolutely that is a great question and um yeah basically they will because that script is going to run um this doesn't necessarily need to like like there are some things that happen on ecs at kind of like what they call conversion time um but this is not one of them this is just like a regular script that's going to you know similarly how you know if you were to spawn a prefab at runtime you know it's awake method is going to run as soon as you spawn it the same thing is going to happen here. It's awake method's going to run. It's going to use, it's going to get a reference to that entity manager. It's going to spawn the entity and so on. So yeah, that's that's totally going to work just fine. Thank you, Johnny. Yep. Um, send him some gold, man. Buy him a drink. <laughs> anyway, coming back to this topic. Uh, it is in play mode. Uh, yeah. Let me go to dots hierarchy. Uh, yep. Because yeah, I have my cube. So I expect to see one entity mm -hmm. at least. And there we go, my cube clone. Nice. Wow. 
it's actually different from uh, the other entities debugger or window, right? Yeah. 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 No, it, it's really nice. And actually, yeah, you can click on that and um, you can see what components are on it in the inspector. It even shows a reference to the transform. Indeed, it does. So if I click here, wow, it actually, you know, highlights. Yep. So yeah, you can see itself. over on the side. Yeah, you can see over on the side, we have the tags at the top. So that's our copy transform from game object tag. Um, you also have the translation tag, which is right now just zero, zero, zero. Um, and then you do also have your, uh, your local to world component as well. Now, what does it know it's a, a tag? Is it because it's empty? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then, yep, you do have a, your reference to your your MyCube transform. Yep. It even highlights the reference, which is pretty damn good. Man. I know. It's nice. And yeah, you can actually edit the values inside the inspector now. So. Wait. So now. Let me actually Although it's not gonna, try this. It's not going to do anything. Wait, but if I move the cube, I would expect this to be always following. It, yes, right? and you should see that update if you move the cube. Yeah, it does. Nice. So I actually just added a tag to say to ask ECS or one specific, let's say, library or module of ECS, whatever, to please. So copy the actually, we can, we can go and we can actually go into that, and I'll show you where you can see that. Um, like yep. the actual system that it, it's running against. So uh, again, go up to window. Dots. And dots. And then uh, systems. I'm running out of space. <laughs> and then I, I docked this one to my console. But I actually did it right. Such a pro. OK. And then I guess I can just open them. I see already some stuff. For example, on update, I have the simulation system and group. Yep. Which is so you see one that, uh, yeah, inside, inside the simulation system group, there will be the transform system group. Yes. And in there, you'll see the copy transform from game object system. From, yeah. And so you can actually click on that. You'll see how many entities are basically being affected by that system. Uh, on the entity count column. And then past that, you'll actually see the time in milliseconds about how long that system is taking. Two entities. Why is that the case? I expected to see only one. Um, let me see. So actually, if you click on the system, you can see over in the inspector, um, it'll tell you what queries This yeah. some type of entity that only has a local to world uh, component. I mean, it's not important. Maybe it's something from Unity, but you know. Yeah. I think I think there's there must be another system in there or something. Mm. But yeah, because there's two queries happening in there. But you should see um, under query number two, there should be that one companion entity. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I cannot see the name of the entity, right? I wish they um, could. So where it says query two, yeah. um, go all the way to the right. And then there's oh. that like kind of like Windows icon. And so, it'll pop open the query on. window. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is my entity. Nice. No, my cube. Yeah. So the components and also the entities. Yep. Super handy. So I guess I could also do the same for the query number one. And see, oh, it's actually on CAC, the companion entity as well, my cube. All right, it's working on the same entity for some reason. Let's assume that's intended. That's what I always do when I have no idea about something. <laughs> Sounds good to me. All right, well, um, so yeah. Now we have the um, basic companion entity spawning, and it's copying its transform from the uh, the game object here. Uh, so now, what we can actually go ahead and do is um, basically create now our our uh, LOD system. So, um, 
Do you mind if I do profiling on this with uh, 100? I'm just curious about the cost yeah, of ahead. the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see, kind of see what we're at. So 100 entities, and it should be copying here. So entity count is 200. <laughs> it's actually duplicating it. Okay, maybe it's the way that the system works, so it's fine. But I, I think is... again, it's because I think it's that two queries that just adds those both together. Ah, gotcha. So, uh, because the system might have two queries, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Makes sense. So, yeah, it says, you know, 0 0.04, uh, basically just copying the transforms from the game object to the entity components, I assume. And, yeah. and I again, there actually... is going to be a little bit of inefficiencies there because it uh, cannot take advantage of uh, multi threading nor the burst compiler. And not even for the copy transform, right? That's correct, because it, okay. it needs a reference to the transform component, which is oh, yeah. a managed component. Um, we do not like transform or any type of reference types. Or no. <laughs> OK, and I actually can see this on the profile as well, right? I see the copy transforms from game object system in the usual profiler. And I can see that the job system is pretty busy. So might actually be still doing some stuff in parallel. Maybe something different. Stash transforms with burst. Okay. Well, sounds it is doing already a bit better. So what do we do now? All right. So yeah, now the next thing that we're going to actually do is um, we're just kind of start, go ahead and creating our uh, LOD, basically the calculation system. So this is basically where, um, you know, we uh, are... Um, are going to be like you know referencing some specific point, and then uh, doing some distance calculations against that to, to determine you know whether we're within that particular range or or greater than that particular range. So, okay. So what do we create? Okay. So um, yeah, trying to think about how exactly we want to do this, how we would want to um, reference a a particular point. So. I guess we could have maybe our, this is it's just like a super hacky way to do this, but it'll be easy. Cause again, we're just referencing against the camera, right? Yep. Um, so I think what we can do is we'll go ahead and create a new system. <clears throat> what? And uh, yeah, you can do a, a new ECS system. That's fine. And call then this? I guess basically at the beginning, we'll just go ahead and get a reference to the camera's translation. And then before we do our entities dot for each, we'll just yank a float three position out of that. And then uh, we can compare against that. So that'll be fine. Okay. How do we name this system? Um, let's go ahead and call this the um like check lod distance system or something right sorry if i bumped the mic there yeah i sometimes do it when i get frustrated as well just punch it yeah i'm, I'm very frustrated right now as you can tell no <laughs> <laughs> so okay so unity created um class coming from system base and then it's overriding the update. And, and you do function. have a partial. It is a partial class, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it partial? Yep. So that is a, a new way that we need to do things as per the uh, entity 0 0.50 version. And actually, a little side note, that thing that we were doing before um, we went live here today where we, um, we you had those errors and you had to say add partial keywords to systems, basically, that's kind of like an automated thing that adds that partial keyword to any system you have in your project. Um, and so, yeah, for some reason, right out of the box, sometimes it doesn't have the partial keywords in every system. So you just, you know, enable that setting and uh, you're good to go. <clears throat> okay. So, um, yeah, so anyhow, um, I just say, yeah, go ahead and just clear out everything inside that on update function. We don't really need any of that. Um, so yeah, first we'll do a class scoped variable here. And you can just make this a, a Unity Engine translation component. 
You mean to create a variable here on the class level? Yes. Okay, so you want a public, just let me know what you want me to write. Um, it can be a private variable. Okay. And it'll be a, a transform component, just unity engine dot transform. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can just call that camera transform or whatever you want to call yep. it. Basically, reference point. transform. All right. Yeah. And then um, now the next thing we're going to do, need to do is um, we're going to need to actually get a reference to that um, basically when the system starts running. And so they're basically, it's it's kind of similar to like a Unity Mono behavior where there are like two different methods to start a system. So there's like the on create and there's also the on start running. So on create is kind of similar to like the awake. It's going to happen, you know, very early on before everything else. Um, on start running is kind of like a combination of the start function as well as the on enable function. Yeah. Um, because every time you say disable the system and re-enable it, that on start running system is going to run again. Okay. Um, the on create will only ever run once, basically when it creates. Um, so we're actually going to be doing this in the on start running. Uh, the reason that we need to do this this way is because um, actually it might still work in on create, but we'll just do it in the on start running anyhow. Sometimes when we're dealing with things in the game object world or things during the conversion process, we won't actually be able to get a reference to that in the on create. Um, so we'll just do it in the on start running. And that's totally fine if we just you know grab a new reference to the transform when this system gets re-enabled if it were to ever, ever get disabled for some reason. So on start running is totally fine. I don't have to pull um, the base, right? That's just nope. from right. And up. actually, if you F12 into the base dot on start running, literally nothing is in there. So um, you can just go ahead and take that out. All right. Um, so I just so then, yeah, grab just reference, right? reference point equal to, um, you know, camera dot main dot transform. No way. Bad boy. What? All right. So there we have it. That looks Correct quite up, similar to what I had here, right? The reference point, just grabbing yep, that. Yep, yep. Although I'm not being thing, grabbing, the, grabbing the reference. I'm not being super consistent with my naming conventions because just because okay. that's fine. We're, we're live. <laughs> so we are ready. We have okay. the transform. Beautiful. Okay. So now, um, in our on update, uh, before your entities dot for each, um, Okay, I see you flipping back there. Um, so yeah, before your entities dot for each, we're gonna go ahead and grab um, basically the transforms position, and we want to store this in a float three. A float three is um, basically just kind of a, a type part of the Unity dot mathematics library, and uh, this really allows us to take advantage of uh, the burst compiler much better. So, um, so yeah, you do a float three, and then you can just call that you know, reference position. And then you just set that equal to uh, reference points dot position. And that should just automatically convert the vector three position into a float three. And I have to say that this is already much uh, better, right? Because I assume that we have the system running only once, right? This update is going to run only once per frame. Uh, that's what I assume. And therefore we are just accessing the camera the position itself and the transform once per frame. That's my assumption, okay? It might be incorrect. While in the original my dummy LOD system, we were accessing the position of the camera every single frame X amount of times, right? If I had 1,000 entities, correct, then I correct. would do these 1,000 yes. times. Yes. Which is one so, yeah, of there, the expensive there are, part. There are, there are a couple things that I do want to point out. One of them being what you just said right there, where basically we're getting this reference once for every single um, essentially companion entity in the project. So that that is a, a major bonus right there. The other thing that I should point out is, again, I mentioned that um, basically reference types like these transforms, we can only use them on the single thread without the burst compiler and all that, which in this case is totally fine because inside the um, on update um, function of these systems, all that stuff is going to run on the main thread anyhow uh, without the burst compiler. When we actually go to create a job, which we're going to do in the entities dot for each, that is when we have to start considering the optimizations of um, 
you know, of, of like multi-threading, um, enabling the burst compiler and all that. So that's kind of where we need to be cautious about these things right now, you know, just everything in the on update function, that's all going to be running on the main thread without burst. Um, but we're, we're going to be essentially scheduling jobs inside that on update function so that they can actually run multi-threaded without the burst compiler, um, at a later point in the frame, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense indeed. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to point that out. Um, so yeah, now we're actually uh, just about ready to kind of do our uh, our entities dot for each here. So just one uh, thing, um, uh, Johnny, I have to say because I was not sure when I was saying this. Okay, and maybe I just made it up. I just yeah. had the feeling that the on update is going to be called only once per frame, but I don't know how Unity actually does this. Is it guaranteed to be called once per frame? Everything that I just put here, or it might be that Unity calls this several times per frame, depending on what you do with tags, components, or whatever. If you do something like in between the frame or something, and um, you know, does this have an impact on how many times this on update is called? Yeah, good good question. So the on update is only going to be called once and only once um, every single frame. Um, basically, there are, there are different kind of uh, like system groups. And when we're back over in Unity looking at the, the systems window, it has all these different groups. And then basically that like parent group, every single frame is going to run through kind of like the high level parent groups and then inside and then those parent groups are actually what call the on update function for each of those system bases. Um, and it just kind of runs them top to bottom in the order that is displayed in the, um, the, in the okay. systems window. And then, yeah, maybe if we get into it a little bit later, we can talk about, you know, system update order and all that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I ask because, you know, I'm always trying to be careful with the stuff that could go wrong. And I can assume that in the worst case scenario, if I add one tag or one component too late in the frame, it might be that, the job system, sorry, that ECS does not execute that until the next frame, right? That doesn't <clears throat> execute the code here, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of where you got to um, <clears throat> careful about start that. start considering system update order and okay. um, yeah, when when components get added to entities and so on. Right. What do we do? Okay. Um, I need to clear my Go throat ahead. real quick. Hold no on. No worries. Get some both I already have it here. Cheers, guys. Okay, I think I'm better now. Um, so yeah, actually, so yeah, we're actually going to need to add uh, one other component to um, our companion entity. And this is basically just going to be, um, yeah, we can do it this way. This is basically going to be a way that we can um, you know, set the set like our target distance of, you know, how far away that it's going to be when it's going to turn our rendering off. Um, so it actually probably uh, Johnny, easiest... could we hard code it to 10 for now or to 10 for now? Or should we go, you know, um, yeah, uh, so we can we can hard code it to 10 for now. That's fine. Okay, so I just want to see well, something running right on the profiler and make sure that I'm doing yeah, that yeah, that yeah eventually yeah. So, it could work. Yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll still need to add a component to um, our companion entity. Um, I think we can just add like a, a, a tag component. Um, actually, you know what? We'll just use the copy transform from game object tag because that we already know is uh, on that uh, entity. Sneaky. Yeah. So um, what you're going to do is after the entities, do another dot. Um, and wh where, sorry? After the entities? Okay, so uh, line 22, like literally yep. right after the word entities. Yep, dot. You're going to do an, another dot and mm -hmm. then do a dot uh, with all. All right. And then inside the type brackets there, we can just put our, uh, our type that we're going to be adding into that query, which is the uh, copy transform from game object. And so again, this is where, you know, if we had maybe a, a specific tag that we would have said, you know, oh, we want to apply LOD filtering to this, um, you know, we would have a specific type. We would add that tag in when we create our companion entity, and then we could filter for it right here. In this case, we know 
there's you know the entities that we already have are going to have that copy transform from game object um so we're gonna go ahead and have that in there and um this is just so we can kind of like you know filter out all the um kind of un unneeded entities essentially i guess and in production we really want to add a tag or even just some component right because this yeah could, and that's, otherwise what, that's, what I, that's what i was going to say at first is that we would actually have maybe a data component and then mm -hmm. that data component could store you know the specific distance of how far away that we would be um in order to to disable rendering all right okay um so yeah right down there where it says the uh ref translation translation in rotation rotation just go ahead and and delete that uh, just go ahead and keep those parentheses and everything now like this remove everything within the for each right and then, so yeah, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be reading from the translation components. And yeah, that's that's actually, I think, all we need, right? Because we're just doing a comparison of where the translation is versus where the reference position is. And then we're just doing a, a hard-coded distance check. Yep. And how do we get the translation? I mean, we just deleted that from the for each, I think. Yep. So yeah, the, the reason that I did that is because the um, the translation that it had there was um, a, a ref to the translation, which means you know you have read and write access to the translation. So we only need read only access. Um, I'm probably not going to get into it too much because I know we've kind of been going a little while for just get this yeah. set up right now. But um, there are some efficiencies for making it a, a read only component. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the way we make it read only is we just say in um, and then we do the translation and you can just call that the uh, lowercase d translation and so yeah that in keyword is the thing that makes it a read only whereas the ref keyword is a read and write access makes sense all right and then so yeah once you have that now we can actually go into your body of that lambda uh, function there in between the curly braces. And then uh, here's where we're actually going to be doing our distance uh, calculation here. And so this is actually on the uh, new Unity Mathematics library. And so basically we just do, it's actually a lowercase m is the class. And then uh, just do a math.distance. Yeah, I can see that it's already taking the float three stuff that we have lying around already, right? Yep, and then just go ahead and drop in your reference position. And then you'll also have to do uh, the, you'll pass in the translation, but you can't just pass in the translation component because, uh, it, or if you just pass in translation, that's the like actual ECS data component. Um, so you have to do translation dot value and the dot value actually gets you the float three position yep. that we're going to be comparing against. You guys remember that you can always peek into the source code, right? Uh, if there are questions about that. And then I need to just pass the reference position. Okay. And this gives me the distance, right? In yep. Flow. And that, that returns your distance. So yeah, you can, you know, store that in a variable and then we can, um, you know, maybe uh just like do a, a hard-coded test against our result there yep so um yeah actually let me just do this boolean yeah i'm gonna actually copy what i had before so, boolean too far away distance is beyond 10 meters and then this is the line that i'm missing uh johnny how do i make a mesh renderer that enabled equals something yep that is a great question so um, again we're going to be doing this in a separate system now the reason that we're doing it in a separate system again is because this is where we start having to consider um like using uh making sure that we're um well because because we want to ideally multi-thread this run it with the burst compiler if we were to access the mesh renderer which um you know we we could um, if we have, again, a component object reference, which I think we still end up will needing to set up anyways. Um, 
we would not be able to use um we would have to run this on the main thread without the burst compiler which again really just kind of eliminates a, a lot of a reference type again yes That's because it is a reference type yeah okay, okay so um basically i think the way that we can so there, there are kind of a couple ways that we can go about doing this um one of them is through tagging and one of them would be through flagging now tagging would be you know we add specific components to um an entity and then that can kind of you know tell us whether the rendering should be enabled or disabled um whereas flagging would basically just be like setting a boolean value uh, yep. true you know true or false and then we'd have you know a follow-on system check that and so on um i think in this case um uh tagging would probably be the best way to go um reason is because you know i wouldn't expect in this particular case entities um you know very like lots like a large number of entities very frequently changing between the you know should render and should not render state if that were the case where we may be we're having entities that were like frequently transitioning between states going back and forth back and forth back and forth that's going to start getting pretty expensive um just you know adding the comp components and removing them um one thing um, johnny uh, uh is it possible that we do this in the main threads and doing stuff here to keep it simple take some measures and say okay this is bull crap let's imp let's improve it further with flagging with a flagging technique for example or whatever that you recommend is it possible just to do this kind of line of code somehow just to make sure that what we want to do actually works still even if it's running on the main threads you know sequentially and such or is it a lot of overhead um to do what part exactly on the main yeah thread? to actually do this here the mesh render enable the mesh render uh, enable yeah uh, exactly yeah actually yeah let's, let's go ahead and do that might as well um so jump back over to your uh character companion entity script yep and so we're actually going to need um to get the the mesh renderer so let me guess um, yeah I'm you're gonna going do to something very similar it's not loaded smart, on my end yet but you're gonna do something very similar where you just do the add component object again adding to the companion entity and then uh you know get component mesh renderer so that will be in our right the add component object companion entity and then just get component mesh renderer of course we are kind of you know assuming that this is all in the same object and such okay we are kind of ignoring all these safety protocols but yeah. is this yeah, the yeah. main idea right to have this line yep. of code Again, just simple high level overview yep okay so yep. we are adding a new reference me. which would be a mesh renderer yep and indeed i assume that's enough for the entity to have that reference and that we can now use it here in the for each loop yep so yeah now we'll go back over to our system and then uh here we'll actually um so yeah what what we end up doing is kind of similar to yeah in the entity step for each we're going to actually add another um, variable in in their query there. Um, so this would actually need to go before the translation. And uh, because it is a component object, I, I'm pretty sure if I remember off the top of my head here, we don't need to add the ref or in keywords because it's it's basically a, a component object reference type. Have any tip for people like me who always forget the order to you know to put stuff on the for each <laughs> like yeah. in ref and all of this um <laughs> i don't know maybe print something out on a sheet of paper or something but um yeah so so yeah basically the way that it needs to be is there are kind of some special variables that go very first um and we're going to be adding one of those a little bit later here um after that you're going to add all your reference types which you shouldn't really be using reference types um, if you can uh, but you're gonna have have those first so you have you know in this case mesh renderer after that you're gonna need um, you know everything that has read and write access so everything with the ref keyword and then at the very end you do anything with the in keyword last 
I guess that's just so it's kind of like special variables, that. reference types, read and write access, read only access. It's kind of like a got a hierarchy there. I will write that piece of paper later on. Maybe that works. There you go. Um, that's yeah. It. So then, yeah, then you can basically just do the mesh renderer dot enabled equals close enough. Now you are setting me up for a trap. This is going to explode, right? And this is going to explode, right? I'm not able to call the schedule on this thing, right? Because the schedule go is ahead going and go to... back to Unity and just 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 show the errors that we get because I think this would be helpful for people. All right, let's go to the console. Entities for each is using managed I component data mesh renderer. Okay, so the mesh renderer is a component in Unity which is managed. It's a yep. reference type and ECS. Uh, well, it's just gonna call it dots. Doesn't like it when I try to schedule uh, a job uh, with this kind of managed data, apparently, right? This is only supported when using both without a burst and run. So yep. I guess this is kind of telling me what I need to do, right? Yep. So I, uh, in, in that case, this is a you know fairly clear error message about what you need to do. Um, so it says, you know, you are using this mesh renderer. Uh, which is a managed type and it's not allowed to you know schedule or, or use the burst compiler so again yeah All we right. just have to go back over to unity um change the uh, or writer rather right um, change the dot schedule to a dot run and mm -hmm. you also will need to add in the uh, dot without, without burst. burst as another uh, parameter there okay it's done let's see if unity likes it more now well there's no more error in the console so that's already a start and I start to feel the itch to click on the play button. May I do that? Benny? Let it rock. Okay. So um, just for anybody who is jumping in right now on the stream or something, uh, the summary of this is that I have a spawner that spawns multiple objects or prefabs or instances or whatever, right? And I have right now, I'm going to have 10 of these game objects, right? What we are going to do is to create one companion entity, which is basically an abstract kind of entity that is going to be holding hands with my uh, cubes, right? The, the cubes that are traditionally living in so nice. Unity as That's game objects. That's a way to put it. Yeah, just call it a hand holder instead of a companion. And we are making sure that uh, the entities are following these cubes because we uh, added these uh, components called uh, copy transform from game objects. And which transform is it going to be? Well, we just pass the transform of this game object itself, right? We just add a reference to that in the entity that's going to be holding hands with our cube, okay? And the last thing we did is basically just to calculate some distances, right? We do not use the cube anymore. Here we are just working with the entity that contains the updated uh, transform, the updated position. And what we're going to do is depending on this distance, we are just going to activate or rather uh, enable or disable the mesh render component, which is a pity, you know, because it is a reference type and we cannot make this ultra efficient uh, because yeah it's a reference type so yeah no i think that's a great summary of what we have so far so um yeah i mean let's let's head back over to unity let's kind of just confirm everything is working here uh, do a little sanity check and then we can do kind of some uh performance metrics on here and uh just guy yeah kind of see where we're at oh, this is very interesting because if i disable these cubes these things are the systems are going to still be running onto these entities, but anyway, it's fine. I'm just going to use one cube to visually see this. I'm going to be moving the cube, which is here, and then I should be able, if I learned things correctly, to go to dots hierarchy and find a cube that is right now setting at zero zero zero, right? So I just go around here and uh, no, 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 you, you actually go ahead and move the game object cube. Yep. I let me set that set number I don't know, set at one and I should be able to see it updated right here. It is. Yeah. 
in the Tots hierarchy, I'm seeing the entity that is holding hands with my cube sitting at set one. So okay. this is looking good. Now the question is what happens if we go beyond 10 meters, right? If we did yes. things right, it should just disappear. If not, I will just end the stream and <laughs> give up game development forever. <laughs> okay, we are approaching the limit. And it's not working. Okay, shit. And now I have to <laughs> give up <laughs> game development. <laughs> All right, let me check a few things. The camera is sitting at, oh, while it's one, okay, zero, zero, zero. And then, yep. Apparently, we are not turning off the mesh renderer. Any ideas okay, why? So the, so the game object is past the 10, right? Yep. It is at 20. Okay. Go to your companion entity. I, I think that... Um, it might not be uh, updating the transform component properly for some reason, or the translation component. Yep. So this is a good use case for learning how to debug these things. For example, I would just do a sanity check, right? The mesh renderer seems like it is correctly assigned to this mesh renderer, right? I just click here and it's highlighted here. The transform is also this cube itself. What of course I need to still be checking is whether we got the right transform, right? Of the camera or the reference, reference point. But right now I cannot do that. Because it's a private uh, thing, right? I think we left. Yeah. So actually, yeah, I, I wonder if this might be what actually is going on. If um, because it doesn't look like the translation component is actually being updated. I think maybe that um, uh, copy transform from game object is just writing directly to the local to world. Okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. I actually missed that part. I was just checking the local to world. Okay. And here it looked okay, I think. Or yeah, if we if one. we look at the query yeah. for the copy transform from game object system, it's actually writing to it's as read and write access to the local to world. Yeah, <coughs> and look, it is correct in the local to world, but it's not in the translation yeah. itself. Okay. Yeah. So what do we so, do about this? Yep. Yeah, so we'll go back to our system and instead of getting an in on the translation uh, in the entity set for each. <laughs> Just change that uh, type to a local to world type. And then um, where you access the the uh, translation dot value or yeah, yep. where you access the translation dot value, um, just go ahead and change that to uh, local to world dot position or you know whatever you have the uh, local to world variable named as. Okay. That should work, I assume, because yeah. the data was correct in the editor. Although I would still be wondering, internally wondering, if that's the thing, why is the translation not updated? I guess because the system does not update the translation. Yeah, I, I don't think it actually uh, cares about the uh... Okay. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's. You know what? You know what? This will be a, a really good moment to actually check it, right? Um, I guess I could just go to right there, and there must be some type of copy transform from game object system. And let's hope that it's not too complex, because if it is complex, I'm just gonna say, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> and here we have quite a few lines of code. Okay, so we have a partial class, which is a system base internal structure stash transforms yeah the well the the blah, blah, the blah. translation stuff um it's it's really good to learn from but it is uh fairly complicated there's some kind of things going on there so we don't have to we don't have to get into that right now yeah but i mean just i think i found this right it is just updating the local to world in this case yeah um, yeah So, okay, I guess we can also do it that way, just the uh, local to world then. And we compile that. And yep. So, yeah, I guess play. I misspoke a little earlier when I said that it copied to the translation, but it uh, looks like it just copies to the local to world. So, that is uh, totally fine.
So there's a, one question. Do debug log functions work from within the ECS code to print out errors to the console? That's a good question. And yes, they do. Um, you do have to use the like string interpolation with them. So you do like the, you know, dollar sign um, quotation marks and all that. And then you can um, uh, basically print out uh, any kind of log messages. I think internally what happens is it kind of converts it to um, what is known as like a fixed string type. So they have these like special um, classes inside Unity ECS where it's like, There'll be like a like a fixed string 64 or something like that. So it means that's a, a 64 um, bit or byte string. Um, and then, so yeah, it, it basically blocks off a chunk of memory. Um, so you, you can kind of use the uh, uh, you know debug messages with um, the oh, yeah. first compiler and all that. So yeah, it, it is, it does work. In the past, I remember that there was a limitation that this kind of stuff Maybe I'm wrong, huh? maybe I forgot or something like this. Only worked if you were doing like a run, but didn't particularly work well if you did a schedule parallel or something like this. Right, did, yeah, it, it does work. So, yeah. It, it does work on parallel as well. Correct, yes. <laughs> All right, so with that burst run, I guess we can run it, right? On Unity and see. Let's make it happen. So let me find the cube. But this leaves uh, this leaves me with a bad taste in the mouth to see, you know, the translation not being really, you know, synchronized with the local to world component. You know. Yeah, I, I know why that's happening. It's um, <laughs> watch my video on uh, how transforms work in Unity ECS, and it maybe will make a little more sense. But it, yeah, the transforms are a little bit of a complex topic, but they're fun. So let's see. Approaching the limit, 9.9 .9 and 11. Oh, it's gone. Hey. Okay, man. And if you come back? Yep, it is working as expected. Cool. So now I'm going and to spawn You should 100. be able to move the camera too, and it would uh, do the same yeah. calling. Actually, yeah. That's possibly the smarter way of doing it. So let me just move the camera. There we go. It's amazing, man. It is amazing. Let's just upload this to the <laughs> asset store and set it for 20 bucks. <laughs> okay, so, system. <laughs> so let's see the profiler because I'm always curious about the profiler. Yeah, what are we at? By the way, if you are profiling on the editor, the first player loop part is usually code, and the second one is uh, tends to be rendering itself. Okay, it's separated by the editor loop, which is no, you know, it's not showing you anything on purpose because it doesn't want to pollute you with details that are not important. If you are really cared about what is going on here, you could always uh, profile uh, the editor as well, but that's normally not really required, right? just going to be noise. So in this case, we are doing the update run behavior. Uh, do I actually still run the old script? Did I just remove it in the past? I didn't remove it. That would be a pretty lame, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think it would be a better start to actually remove it from my prefab, right? <laughs> this one, right? Just to make sure I'm not crazy, man. Sometimes I really doubt if I am crazy. My dummy LOD system. My dummy LOD system, yeah. So maybe it actually never worked. So let's see. No, I think it actually <coughs> looks good. So let's move the camera again. So there we go, it's still working. So whoosh. I was starting to sweat, man. Uh, all right, so let's go to the profiler again and keep recording. And now that cost should be gone from the behavior updates group. And now we should only have the, yeah, the check LOD distance 
system, which is our code, right? And then of course we also have the other code from Unity. Uh, the system like is the copy transform from game object system. Okay, everything is looking good so far. And we're asking Unity to run this sequentially, right? Because of this uh, schedule, no, sorry, was it? Because of run. Yep, and we're running I... it on the main thread. So yeah, basically what that's going to do is it's going to just, yeah, high level on that system is it's going to filter out everything with those particular components that we have defined. And it's going to uh, basically just has like a collection of those and it runs through them in order. Um, there are many efficiencies with the ECS system that, you know, basically group those things all together in memory. So like literally we're just going to, you know, one section of memory and we're just going to be able to run right through all those. So it's, it's um, it, a, a big efficiency gain right there. Um, it's actually compared. Uh, I know it's not what we should be doing, uh, right? To have these two systems running at the same time, but why not, man? Let's actually have them both and then just compare it face to face for 1000 objects, okay? So record, okay, enough, enough is enough. So here we have the behavior updates with 1000 game objects uh, being called on the uh, update function, right? And here we see a huge chunk of 1.74 milliseconds. Remember the code is pretty simple, right? But sometimes simple doesn't mean uh, easy. And we're just hmm. doing calculating the, calculating the distance and then changing the mesh renderer enable flag. And uh, that's taking 1.7 milliseconds. And then on the right side, we have the, in theory, slightly better way of doing this, even though this is still sequential, right? We run a system where we kind of do the same, only that we save on a few things. And we can already tell that by checking the, the cost, right? It's 1.7, the old one, versus 0 0.7 or 75 in total, okay, of both systems. So this is already a pretty big gain, I have to say, even if we are running this on the same thread, okay, sequentially. So in this, in this case, thank you, Johnny. That's really already very helpful. You got it. But we are not done, right, Johnny? Oh. Tell me why, what's wrong with this? Okay, so um, basically, what we what is happening right now is we're running this whole job again um, on the main thread without the burst compiler. Um, really, the main point of this whole video that we've done so far is we want to do our distance calculation, which is you know fairly expensive, um, but it is just kind of a, a a basic, more or less basic math operation. Um, so kind of the optimization that we want to make is to be able to run this distance calculation um, on all our entities, basically be able to run those in parallel. So we're not doing, you know, one distance calculation, another distance calculation, another distance calculation, waiting for our main thread to do all that stuff. Um, let's actually go ahead and split this out across, you know, all uh, Ruben's 32 threads that he has available to him. Um, is this why and, it looks uh, so empty here, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see that yeah, nothing, there's nothing in that that whole job area right there. All right. So yeah, basically that'll be the first thing that we want to do. And then the other thing is we do also want to use the burst compiler. The the burst compiler um, is fairly complex um, how it works under the hood, but um, it is more or less simple in the fact of you know the way that you use it is if you can use, you know simple data types, um, just kind of, you know, floats, integers, things of that nature. Um, it can kind of like compress that data and uh, do the math operations much more efficiently. So uh, what we're going to do here is basically break our system up. So we're doing, you know, one system with all the complex distance calculations and everything like that, um, which is going to be able to take advantage of multi-threading as well as the burst compiler. And then we're going to have another system um, that is actually going to um, be, it, it's the one that's going to run on the main thread without burst, which actually you know enables or disables the rendering. Sounds good. Yeah, do you have time for a question there, so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First is, what is Johnny's channel? So that's not really a question for you, but I'm just going to find the link to your YouTube channel and put it in the chat. The second one is, so do you still need to pass 
their reference uh, to the transform in the entity itself. I assume he means this one. And I'm going to find your uh, link to your channel in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yep, just Turbo Makes Games. Uh, if you look for any <laughs> DOTS or ECS videos, you'll come across my channel very quickly. But um, I put it in the channel. So yes, so yes to answer the, the uh, second question, yes, you do still need to pass in that translation reference or the, the transform reference rather. Um, because that copy transform from game object still needs a reference to the original translation uh, to copy over to our local to world. Um, again, without that, we're just not going to have that reference and it, it wouldn't know where to copy from, basically. So I guess that we can say that this screenshot says it all, right? Actually, the other way around, right? Should be more like the system requires this transform, right, to work. Well, not sure if you said anyway. Not important. Let's keep going. So yeah, the, the thing we actually I don't think we actually need, but we can just still leave it in. It's fine. Is the uh, the type of translation on the companion entity because that's yep. basically not doing anything. Remove that. But yeah, that's fine. We can just keep it on for now. We don't want to incidentally break anything. Um, you're, <laughs> your stream is catching up. I have no idea what you're doing with these emojis. And <laughs> wow, I made that like 30 seconds ago. All right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this, yeah. Okay, so I left the translation component just not to break anything, but I get it that in theory we, we just do not need it because it was yeah, not even yeah, updated yeah. anyway, right? From the copy transform. So, so how do we split, split the job? Uh, this stuff into a different job and such. Yes. All right. So um, go over to our system here. Um, you're probably on it, but the stream isn't caught up for me. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, basically what we're going to do is, I think the way that we're going to do this is we're going to have a couple of different tag components that we're going to um, need to either add or remove to the to the entity at different points in our code. So basically, I think what we should do here is we will have a, we'll start with um, a tag by default that'll be on every single companion entity, which is renderer enabled. And then, so we can just basically filter for every entity that has the renderer enabled. Um, <clears throat> we'll also have another one for renderer disabled. So, you know, we can look for anything that has its renderer disabled. And then we're also going to have a third tag. And this one's going to be basically added or removed, which is just kind of the change renderer state. So let's say that we have an entity that has the render enabled tag. And then we add the change renderer state. Well, then we can have a system that runs off of everything that has its render enabled. And it has that change render state we can actually go ahead and um, disable the, the mesh renderer and then basically change the tags around. So now we take off the render enabled, we'll add the render disabled, and then we'll also remove that change render tag because we just need that for that, that one frame that it changes. So does that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, I guess that these tags we need to create, right? There is nothing um, already yes, coming we'll from need to, We'll need to create our tags. Let's actually go ahead and do this um, just on the um, character companion entity script. That's just like an easy enough place to do those. Normally in production, um, we would need to create one file for each tag, right? But that takes uh, a long time. You don't. You don't need to. Um, I'd no. say it's best practice to have you know one component per file. No. Um, there is one little little wrinkle in there, which is where if we were using the authoring workflow, where if we want to say you know drag this component onto a game object that's going to be converted at runtime, um, <clears throat> there is a convert. Um, what, what is it now? Generate authoring component uh, attribute that you can add to those components. Um, and only one of those work per file. So you can't have like multiple components with that attribute in them. Okay. But we are going to do it here because <laughs> it's going to be faster and everything. Right? Yep. Yep. So right. yeah, this is going to be outside the, the class. Um, mm -hmm. just go ahead and create a public struct 
and we'll just call this uh, render enable tag or render enabled tag. I component data, right? Implement I component data. And again, it's just an empty tag. So just you know, open and close your curly braces. Um, you basically do the same thing with render renderer disabled. And then um, we can just do like a another one, which would be like the change render state tag. Okay, yes, one question about this. Is it better in terms of performance to have three tags that are empty? Or for example, if I mixed or joined the first two ones by adding a Boolean, right? For example, render state, and then just having a Boolean, whether that's true or false. I'm not sure if you know what I mean. Yep, I know I know exactly what you mean. So um, it, it really depends on kind of how you're you're implementing this project um in this particular case i find it better to have separate tags so we can have um basically like separate queries um to kind of like uh, filter out for yeah. you know what is enabled and what is disabled and then that way we're not actually like going through and doing checks inside of our systems to see whether the oh yeah exactly because oh, yeah, I get your point. we, we could end up in a situation where, you know, maybe only one entity falls under one particular category, but we still have to go through every single one and check to see whether it, it has that particular thing or not. So I'd say in general for data oriented design, it is better to, um, you know, use different components to kind of like filter out um, like where, like what, what properties or whatever yep. a component has. Um, just because it, it saves us some optimizations down the line. Again, it is going to be a little bit expensive to add and remove these tags very frequently. So, you know, there are some cases where you might have to do a, a little bit of a cost benefit analysis to determine whether it's better to use tags or the yep. conditional operations. Okay, makes sense. So I guess that we can also assume to simplify things that I can just add the renderer enabled tag by default when I create the entity, although that also depends on the position. Yeah, so we'll we'll add the uh, render enabled tag by default, and then basically the system's just going to run first, and if it's outside of that, then it's going to, you know, change the rendering. Okay, so I added that uh, in the create entity function just at the end after the copy transform from game object. Is that correct? Beautiful, yep. Okay, and now? Okay, so now we'll come over to our system and mm -hmm. we're actually going to need uh, to kind of break this out into a, a, a couple different systems. So basically one's going to be kind of our distance checking system. Um, the next one's going to be, and then I think we're going to just going to have two systems or so we'll have, then we'll have, yeah. So we'll have one distance checking system, um, one enable rendering system, and then one disable rendering system. All right. So how do we do that? Okay. So um, one thing that we are going to need is what is known as an entity command buffer. Now, um, I guess in the interest of time, we can kind of just do this sort of the, the easy way here. Um, so after you get the reference position, we'll go ahead and create a new entity command buffer. Yep. So just say like var ECB equals a new entity command buffer. Um, and then inside there, we have to pass in uh, the allocator. And uh, this is just going to be um, an allocator dot temp job. Yeah, um, I mean, I would have questions about that, but maybe we can keep going forward. Maybe later we'll have time for that. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that we can go into yeah. on, on entity command buffers. Um, I have a video on the channel going into uh, kind of how to use them and and um, a better way that we can do them than just because we're just yeah, this is this is fine for now. So ECB. Yep. Um, so we have our ECB. Okay, so now uh, what we're going to do is again, we'll first do our, our distance checking system. 
Um, and so we can just kind of refactor this existing one that we have right now. So our entities dot with all uh, copy transform from game object. Uh, so go ahead and remove the mesh renderer. By the way, can I actually give this system a name or something? Because if we are going to create more systems, it would be good to have it documented both in code and maybe uh, in the system debugger or visualizer. That That is a great question. And you can do that. Um, so just kind of like similar how you're doing a, a dot with all, you can do a dot with name. And then in there, you can pass in the name of the job. Now you can't use any um, like spaces or anything like that, but you can use underscores if you want. And uh, we're going to call this distance calculator. Okay, something like this. Yep. So I removed the mesh renderer because of course we don't need an access, uh, the access to that. We just need the position, right? And uh, that way, eventually we will be able as well to run this in parallel, right? Because if we left the mesh renderer, this is kind of a reference type. And that yep. would not allow us to to run this in parallel. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah. Also, we are going to need a reference to the entity itself. So this is kind of one of those um, like special um, parts of the the entities that for each function that I was referencing a little bit earlier. Um, so this needs to go before anything else in your your for each query here. Um, so basically, you'll just do um, uh, type in, pass in the type of entity, which is capital yep. E, and then um, you can just call it, uh, you know, entity, entity companion entity, whatever you want. Oh, actually, I think that's amazing to call it companion entity. Yeah, just it's a little more, a little more clear. But yeah, yep. so that's basically a reference to the this particular entity that we're um, you know kind of iterating across at that given point in time. I know. Okay, so now um, what we're going to do, um, so we'll go ahead and do our distance calculation. And then, so we'll say, let me think how we want to do this. Um, yeah, I assume that we need to store it, right, somewhere. So yeah, what we're gonna end up doing is when we have the distance, and then, so say if the distance, so close enough means. Um, also, yeah, rename this to uh, shoot renderer be enabled. Yeah. Clear. So we can say, like, sh if should render be enabled and renderer or and, and we check for if it has the render disabled component. So that's basically what we want to like when we yep. want to change the state, right? Um, and basically the way that we check for that is um, there's just a, a, a thing that says has component. And it's part oh, wow. of the system based namespace. So that'll just kind of allow us to get that. Oh wow. I find this pretty cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, inside the type brackets, then yeah, we can just look for um, the render disable. So if the renderer should be enabled, but it is not because it has the tag saying that it's actually disabled, then I yep. guess we need to kind of flip the components or actually just add the change render yep. state. We'll, right? so yeah, in this case, yeah, we'll just add the, the change render component. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know if the stream's caught up yet, but yeah, you just need to pass in the companion entity into the has component. Yep, makes sense, yeah. Done. Okay, and then here we'll use our entity command buffer to actually um, add the change tag to that entity. Yeah, it's uh, the add component, I assume. Yeah, ECB .add components, and then inside the type brackets, you can just pass in the change render state tag and then, um, yeah, inside the parentheses, just pass in the companion entity for now. We'll have to come back and change something on that later. All right, it's done. And should okay. I also do it the other way around? Like an else, if it should not be enabled, but it is, then add. 
Actually, it correct. Can be put yep. in an all, yeah, right? Do, I'd say do it. Do an else if um, should render be enabled and um, has the render enabled tag. Yeah, I'm just gonna put this on some type of or, I guess. I guess that we are gonna do the same, right? Which is to add the component itself, right? Or it shouldn't be enabled. Yeah, however, however you want to optimize. Yeah. All right. So I am just done doing that. I'm going to read, read this I just may, to make sure it makes sense. Should render be enabled, but it is disabled or should not be enabled, but it's enabled. Then I, in any of these cases, I'm just going to add the change render state tag. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I'm pretty good as apparently at messing up simple code like this, by the way. So <laughs> that's why we always read it three times. It's all good, man. Okay, so uh, that should be all good to go. Um, so basically, yeah, this is just basically detecting whether we need to turn the renderer on or off. And we, we basically with this is we're like trying to limit the number of times that we're using main threaded non burst compiled code um, with reference types. So again, we're just looking for, you know, the specific instance where we need to change the renderer from enabled to disabled or the other way around. Um, so this system should be squared away. Um, I would say just remove the dot without burst for now. Let's go ahead and keep it running on the main thread for the time being, um, just so we can test it and make sure everything works first. And then, um, so what we need to do at this point is now we actually have not added the component, uh, the change render state components to that entity, even though it looks like we have, um, we actually haven't done that yet. We've basically just recorded this operation to our entity command buffer. So now we actually need to basically play back those changes on our entity command buffer. Come on, I would prefer it to be called flash. <laughs> it's in, uh, I mean, it's so used to command buffers and all of this stuff. So it's called playback, right? Yes, so it's yeah, ecb.playback. And then, um, yeah, at the end, the entity command buffer does need to be disposed, but we'll, we'll probably end up using the entity command buffer in another job in the system, so we can do that later. It's requiring an entity manager reference. Yep, huh? and then Where so gets... inside there, you just pass in the uh, entity manager, just capital E, entity manager, and that'll get the um, entity manager that of the world that that system is a part of. It's actually a bit confusing because I would assume that it's actually the type, but yeah, I guess some type of yeah, it's a, attribute. Okay. The, yeah, exactly. Okay, so by I guess this is kind of a blocking call, right? When we do this playback, Unity is going to say, okay, let's stop everything right now, every job. Right, order. yeah, so let's... this is, yeah, this is again just kind of a, a hacky way to do this for now, um, yep. just so we can just do a simple entity command buffer. There are better ways that we can do this by essentially hooking into already existing entity command buffers, um, but that's going to basically defer playback until later in the frame. We don't want that yet. Yes. Um, this might give us problems later on for some things, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we'll go ahead and create um, our, our two different jobs here for um, enabling or disabling the rendering. So we'll go ahead and do an entities dot with all. And then inside the type brackets, we'll go ahead and we'll do the disable rendering one first. So that we're looking for anything with the renderer enabled tag, as well as the change render state tag or whatever. And, whatever we call okay. that. So I could yeah, call this it. job in this case, uh, disable renderer, for example, right? Correct. Okay. Done. 
Okay, I think I've got to wait for this stream to catch up. But um, so inside the type brackets, did you do a, a render enabled comma yep. and then okay, cool. the change render state tag? Yeah, cool, perfect. Yep, I'm seeing that now. Um, and you have the with name, perfect. Okay, so now inside our for each, um, you have to do yep. I so you got that other guy there for the lambda function. Um, so now we're looking for um inside the query i think all we need now at this point is the um our our reference to our our renderer so kind of similar to how we had it before you just do your um mesh renderer type with no ref or in and then just call it the mesh renderer yep done okay and then so here all you're going to go ahead and do is say um, mesh renderer dot disable or what enable equals false. <laughs> and then um, after that, now we just need to Oof, take there. off the render enabled tag, take off the change render state tag, and then add the render disabled tag. So we're going to do all those operations using the entity command buffer. Um, so again, you know, very similar to how we did in the previous system, we can just do our ECB um, dot add components and remove components operations for the I'm just going to do that in the meantime I assume that the entity should go before the mesh renderer right oh uh, yes yeah 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 okay so I'm going to remove the change renderer state it's going to remove as well the enable tag the renderer yep. enable tag and it's also going to add a component which is going to be of course the renderer disabled tag Correct. And uh, the other job should do the opposite, kind of, right? Exactly. Now, the question I would have in this case is, should I play back in between these two jobs? Um, I guess not. I would say I would say no, because there's no. Yeah, there there would be, yeah there would be no reason to. All right. So in the second job, I'm going to actually I'm going to give it. And you do have to do a dot run at the end of your as you set for each. Yep, that's a good point. So run uh, without burst, I assume, right? Because we're messing with the reference. Yes, types. yeah, you do have to do. Yeah, this does have to be on the main thread without the burst compiler. Correct. All right. Uh, that's done. Um, so in the second job. Uh, you know, I'm going to give it the name enable renderer yep. with all render disabled. And yet I also want to change the render state. And in this case, I am going to remove the component, which is renderer disabled tag. I'm going to change, remove the change state as well. And I'm going to add the renderer enabled tag because of course it is now enabled right after i Boom. changed the enable to true you got it and uh, now at the end of these two jobs should i do the playback or is unity going yes to do so this now you eventually? can do an ecb dot playback and then an ecb dot dispose all right it's done although i'm getting a warning from right there captured variable is this post yeah, that's, the that's that happens that's fine you can just ignore that all right so now i'm trying to be switch. too smart for you are you saying that it is trying to outsmart me oh jesus no we have the sharing violation again oh no. you guys know oh, we're doing so good fix it right uh, yes Close only the, the project. people have been here for only the people have been here for two hours now. <laughs> that, no, thank you guys for all showing up. I mean, this has been a ton of fun so far. I mean, we're, of course, we're going to keep going, but um, I think Ruben has some issues to work through. But hey, if you've been enjoying these streams, make sure you hit the like button on uh, both Ruben's stream as well as my stream. Um, that sounds very really creepy to say. Ruben has its issues, right? His own issues. Let him be. Let yeah, him be. Ruben has his own issues, so just let him work through them. Okay, so the solution for this problem was before to close it and open the project. Hey, uh, you're always having fun, so that's a good sign. <laughs> okay, first time, still, the error is there, okay? So click ignore. I don't really know why this is happening, honestly. It is super annoying. But yeah, by the way, in the meantime, I can also read something aloud. 
which is uh, very sadly I have to leave. I wanted to say, I didn't. I wanted to say that this has been the most useful session on dots that I have ever attended. The clear use case and detailed explanations totally made sense. Thank you both. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that nice comments. Hopefully you're uh, watching the, the replay to finish off the stream. But yeah, it's, I feel like it's been a ton of fun. I think it's yeah definitely helpful for people to just kind of, you know, go through um you know everything really step by step and just kind of like kind of learn a little bit of the the methodology as well as the implementations of how to do it i think um you know sometimes in some of my videos i can go a little bit fast sometimes through some things but i think it's always good to just kind of you know take it a little slower and um you know just kind of step through things really explain you know why we're doing each thing and all that um but yeah i've been having a ton of fun this has been great have you seen this john well it's second time <laughs> it's uh, still working so that's the quick workaround open <laughs> the project twice like so no, it twice there you go all right that's so all right it's compiled uh are we actually ready to play this i mean first i have to go to the prefab and disable the old script which is the mono behavior based one and um, but other than that are we ready to play yeah and oh yeah, it looks like someone's saying that we might get some errors trying to play back our entity command buffer twice, but um I see. That's I fine. see. Okay. Um you we'll probably just have to take out that first playback and it can just run on a the next frame. Should I play? I still and see if you need to complain yeah, about see what it. what happens. All right. So play mode enabled. Yeah, oh yeah. I don't want to see this. You guys don't want to see this. Just uh, clear it. Shield your eyes. <laughs> so I'm going to disable the first playback. And now you are saying, and I have to trust you, that you're saying that the other jobs are going to be executed on the next frame, right? That for me would be kind of a black box. I just trust you. But yeah, that's an important detail to take into account. How do you know that? Is this experience or? Correct. So basically the reason this is happening, again, like I was saying earlier, when we do an ecb.add component, that does not actually add the component to that entity right away. That just records that. And then that component isn't added to the entity until we play back our um, entity command buffer. Now our entity okay. command buffer isn't going to be played back until after those jobs that we have. Uh, okay. those other jobs that we have. Oh, I mean, we could do this if we like maybe separated this out into another system or had like a different entity command buffer. That um, works, man. Yeah. Okay. So that means that it is going to be delayed one frame, right? And uh, the activity yeah, yeah. or the activation of yeah. renderers. Okay. I'm just going to hit play again. Okay, so far no errors, tons of cubes. I'm going to be moving the camera away and they are disappearing. So this is really good stuff, right? So I know that you might not be seeing that, but it makes me proud to see what I accomplished today, thanks to your help. Of course, you, you guys know I'm exaggerating, okay? Uh, the original problem I had with consulting is uh, done it's solved but i have to say that i'm still learning quite a lot of things i'm i was also pretty outdated right i've seen some stuff that uh is pretty useful to learn um so yeah uh this is working so what i would say is that i would like to compare now the cost of the original solution we had with mono behaviors with this system um but first johnny are we done or do we need still to do something with this? Yeah, so right now, um, basically everything is still being ran all single threaded. Um, right. So, uh, I mean, if you want, we can we can flip the multi-thread bit as it were. Okay, but now it's with burst. I yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's basically working all all single threaded, um, kind of using an, an entity command or an entity com entity component system. I know what I'm talking about. 
um, pattern. So there, there are some optimizations just by using uh, this kind of ECS pattern. Um, but again, as of right now, everything's still running on the main thread. Um, I will say that though, burst is enabled on our distance calculation system. So um, again, we, we're kind of at a point where we, we sort of have some optimizations, but um, there are a number of more things that we can do. Um, some of them we probably, probably don't have time for today. But, yeah. um, but we're good to go, right? I can already take some measures. So I'm going to leave the original mono behavior uh, enabled. So it might be, you know, doing these switches crazily, but that's fine. It's going to record a few frames and do some comparison, right? So the original mono behavior, uh, at least in this particular frame, Let's actually take one that makes more sense. 1.66 milliseconds. And that's the case for 1,000 cubes. OK. You can see it here, right? It's quite a long line. And if we go to the update function, I'm seeing quite a lot of allocations. But yeah, that's maybe another story. So I have the check LOD distance system which is 0 0.1 milliseconds. It is uh, obviously faster than previously because of course we are also just not, you know, messing with the reference objects. And then we have the, actually, oh, I was almost confused. Okay. So we have the check LOD distance system, but that includes all the systems, right? The three systems that are inside. So Correct. the whole yeah. system, the three systems is are, are taking one uh, zero point one milliseconds. Okay, so that's actually even better than I thought. So we are looking into comparing the numbers of one point seven milliseconds for the mono behavior uh, approach. To depending on how you want to measure that, um, maybe something like zero point thirty five milliseconds depending if you want to take into account the copy transform from game object system and such, I would argue that we should take in that into account. But even yeah, then- Yeah, it makes sense because there is extra overhead that we are adding in with that. Yeah, exactly. But even then the gains are quite substantial, right? I think before we did this, the previous iteration where we actually did this flip on the enabled flag, when we did this within the same um, uh, system, when we only had one system, we had about 0 0.5 milliseconds more or less, right? And now we reduced that to, let's say, 0 0.34 milliseconds. Just re trying to recall on top of my head, okay? So yes, we see definitely some progress in terms of performance, but we are not done yet, right, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, the last kind of big thing that we can do here is uh, do some multi-threaded action. Can we call the schedule parallel already? Yep. So you go ahead and do schedule parallel. Uh, we will need to. So we will need to change up um, how our entity command buffer works. Let's. Um... So basically, we're going to have to have two separate entity command buffers. So one will be essentially a single threaded entity command buffer, and then one will be um, a, a parallel entity command buffer. So the, the single threaded one will be required for those, um, uh, the single threaded jobs down below. Um, I think probably the most efficient way would be to use one of the built-in entity command buffers. So maybe we can just show that off real quick just because it's it's not too terribly difficult to do. Um, so uh, what you should do just kind of for clarity's sake, we'll just go ahead and move that entity command buffer that we're creating, uh, move that below the distance calculator job just so it sits right above the two main thread jobs just so that's kind of, you know, it's all, Kind of just makes it clear that that entity command buffer is for those those two yep. jobs down below. Uh, I'm going to do that. I just messed the order. So, so the main thread, of course, is going to be the ones where we do the mesh render enabled flag. Okay, 
and the parallel one is going to be, of course, for the distance calculator, I assume, right? Correct. Right. Um, so yeah, what we'll, what we'll do, I think, yeah, instead of creating our own entity command buffer, we will uh, use basically one of the built-in ones. So let me what? know when you're ready to start. I'm ready. That. All right, so uh, this would be a class scoped variable. It's going to be a private, and get ready for uh, this name here. It's the end simulation entity command buffer system. Yeah, go on. And, and then uh, you can just call this like underscore ECB system is usually what I call it. All right, done. All right, now we're going to need an on start running function. This should be a protected override void on start running. Um, oh, we already have that. Duh. Um, so yeah, inside there, we'll just do our ECB system equals world. Yep. Again, that's the capital W world dot um, get existing system. A logistic problem. This unit is taking a different world, I believe. Get existing system. Yep. And then, um, I pass and then the into type, the type right? brackets. Yep. End simulation entity command buffer system. And you don't yep. need to pass in any arguments. And then right. now um, in the on update function where you have your ECB parallel, uh, we'll set that equal to uh, underscore ECB system dot create command buffer. And then uh, after the parentheses, we'll just do a dot as parallel writer. All right. That's going to be of type parallel writer, right? Yep. And there are many, many different types of parallel writer. So I'm just going to call this var. Yeah, just call it var. I use the wild card. <laughs> Um, well, actually, so yeah, the type is entity command buffer dot parallel writer, just for clarity. Wow. All right. But anyhow, um, yeah, that's fine. So um, what we're going to need to do now is you can go ahead and change everything in your distance calculator over to that new ECB parallel. Uh, we are going to get some errors right off the bat. So yep. it doesn't like warned. the companion entity anymore. I uh, know it likes the commanding entity, but it just needs something, something extra. Uh, gotcha. Sort of key, right? Yep. And so the way that we get this sort key, and is the sort key first, or the first argument? Yep. Okay. So um, what you're going to do up in your entities dot for each. Um, after where it says entity, and this is, I might just like put this in the chat because it can be sometimes annoying to type in. On Discord, right? On the private yeah. Discord channel where we talk about cool stuff. Yeah, you pass that as the second argument. So this is another of those um, kind of like special parameters for our entities dot for each functions. And so this one goes after the entity and it must have this exact specific naming convention with that proper capitalization like that. Basically it's uh, an int entity yeah, integer. inquiry index. Correct. Index. Yeah. And so basically what this means is this is a unique index for uh, every single entity in this query. Um, basically right. just you know, starting at zero, going up to the maximum number. Um, the reason that we have this is we pass that into our uh, ECB operations. And then so when we go, because when we're doing things multi-threaded, you know, there's kind of the whole concept of race conditions where we don't know exactly the order that things will be executed in. So by using this sort key, we can, basically determine uh, the order to play back our changes when we run our entity command buffer. So um, can I think of that as the index of a for loop if I was iterating over a list of entities that I yeah, 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 yeah. would be the entity inquiry index, right? 
Correct. Yeah. So this particular right. entity that we're iterating across, it's going to, you know, say it's like the third entity in that query, you know, the, um, you know, the, the number of that's going to, well, it's going to be two, but, yep. um, it's yeah, unique per entity. Okay. And, um, so we need to do one more thing here and let me get this correctly here. So this is, um, system dot okay so after our schedule parallel you'll do our underscore ecb job system or yeah underscore ecb system dot add job handle for producer can you repeat it because it's outside the entities right just after the schedule parallel correct after the schedule parallel yep. go ahead repeat it please yeah ecb system dot add job handle for producer yep, and then pass in uh, the capital D dependency property, which is a, a dependency property of this system base. Oh yeah, because that's in the system base, right? I assume. Yep. Yep. And yeah, so basically the reason that we need to do this is um, it basically adds the proper dependencies to our entity command buffer so that it knows um, like what jobs need to be completed before the entity command buffer. Okay, so just for me to understand this, before we used to run this, uh, like, you know, on the main thread and we were actually waiting for that, right? Now we are scheduling this to be happening in parallel. And because we are doing this, we kind of have to tell Unity that it has to eventually wait on this job or yeah, job that we just scheduled, right? Is that correct? So uh, close, but not entirely. The The reason that we're doing it is not because we're scheduling it in parallel. The reason that we're doing this is because we're using uh, one of Unity's built-in entity command buffers. And so we need to do this to pass in the proper dependencies. So we need to know what jobs need to be completed before our entity command buffer can mm -hmm. play. Okay, that makes more sense. All right. Okay, it looks like you're getting some errors uh, down in your script. Yeah, uh, I didn't change it because do we still want to use the new entity buffer, uh, the entity command buffer that we created for the main thread? So we, yeah, we have to use the existing uh, main thread entity command buffer for our other jobs. Okay, because so those the are one that we jobs. create, right? As a temporal job with the allocator of temporal job. Yep, that's fine. Yeah. So yeah, it's just a matter of renaming this. Okay. So, and I assume we need to do a playback and a dispose at the end, right? Indeed we do. All right, let's see if Indy is happy with the compilation. Yep, seems to be happy about the changes so far. Are we ready for a play mode test or? Let's let her rock, baby. Uh, before I play, of course, I want to disable the previous one. The previous scripts, the old object oriented programming script that always ends up sending me to the physiotherapist. <laughs> back, back pain. Okay, so let me move the camera. And this is not working exactly as I would expect. This is basically just switching the renderer enabled flag back and forth. Um, so some type of synchronization yeah. issue, I assume. I mean, maybe it is oh, looking fine, and it's just my eyes that are tired. <laughs> it's 9 p.m. Is that happening to all of them, or is it just the like ones around the edge? Actually, let me check. Uh, into everything, man. Oh man, this really hurts. <laughs> no, not actually, not to everything, to everyone. There's one cube in front of me that is kind of working fine. That's really weird. 
Yeah. Um. Okay. All right, let's go back to our script. It's probably just because we're doing some weird things here. Um, Can I somehow run this on a single thread without changing or removing the add job handle for producer? Can I just make this single thread with the run? Or does it change the way I need to do this? Like the entity command buffer, you mean? Yeah, can I just change the schedule parallel to just run? Uh, you know, to run this. That's what we had before. End. Yeah, but yeah, we had that before, but we oh, had our oh, own oh, ECB, oh. right? Or in, um, um, it might let you do that. I mean, I'm just gonna try it and see what's going on. But you know, that's why I would possibly start if. Oh, no, it's fucked oh, up no. again, man. Oh okay. no. So yeah, this is one of the things I would try at first, right? To, okay, so this looks weird when it's in parallel. Maybe I can just run this on a single thread and uh, try to keep the rest of the code the same. See if that changes or if it breaks. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm just telling you this to make a bit of time for Unity to open again. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if maybe there's something that we're doing in. Um the way that we're scheduling these jobs so that like it it keeps going back and forth between the the two different enable and disable jobs um yeah i mean we can maybe do a little little live debugging session here if we um kind of go on some of these entities and just see if that tag is like for some reason constantly being added or removed um Even more errors. Let's hope that the second time it's actually gone. Okay. So yeah, my only concern there would be: Can I actually see that this, you know, components being added and removed on real time? Because they seem to be alternating, right, every frame. So, well, I guess. Yeah, I, can... I mean, we can we can inspect them. Like if we find them in the dots hierarchy, we can look at the inspector and see. I think someone in your chat had a good suggestion of just maybe just try a couple entities yeah. at first. Is it still opening back up for you right now? Oh, uh, it's opening the second time. Yeah, I think it's okay. looking good. I don't know, man. I I can tell. I cannot tell you why it's looking good, or it seems to be looking good from my side. I guess it's just a feeling that I developed over time with Unity, right? When it stops working and suddenly <laughs> just unconsciously. You know, restart uh, twice. The restart yeah, twice. Yeah, it is. So I'm gonna play, and this is working better, although not perfect. I only see one right now that is kind of okay. No, it's going back. Seems like if you leave it stable, it's kind of okay. But once you start messing with the tags, when you go far away and such, then this is kind of an endless loop, right? So I can just go to a cube, and I guess I can go to the dots hierarchy. And yes, it keeps adding and re-adding these components, right? Removing, re-adding, and such. And mm. this is happening too fast for me to really see. Um, you could pause it and, and step through execution. Oh, yeah, right? that's a good step. So, so I have renderer enable tag. Next step, renderer enable tag plus the change renderer state tag. Mm -hmm. Next step, renderer disabled tag and change renderer state tag. That's interesting. Is it not being like properly removed or something? Yeah, looks like. That's weird because that was definitely working before. <laughs> so let me see. We have the ECB main thread. We allocate it uh, with a temporal job. Uh, we just remove two components. 
and add one, remove two components, add another one, enable renderer without burst run. Um, yeah, there might be. I think. Hmm. I assume this is let's, not running let's twice. Let's go ahead fine. and yep. use that. Instead of creating our own entity command buffer, mm -hmm. let's use the um, end simulation entity command buffer system to create a single threaded entity command buffer. All right. So ECB system dot or not. Dot. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll say our main thread ECB equals ECB system dot uh, was it command, command buffer. buffer? And you don't need to do the as parallel writer. Um, but then at the end, you can't do the ECB playback and dispose. You'll just have to do the um, actually just pass the ECB system jo add job handle for producer. Just put that down at the very bottom of that class or that update method. Okay, okay. Uh, that was a lot of information. <laughs> So right now I am stuck at ECB system dot create command buffer, and I didn't add anything else. Yep, after that's that, that's all you need. And okay. then um, just go ahead and take the uh, ECB system dot add job handle for producer. Just take that line of code and put it down to the bottom of that update method. All right, and we still dispose do the playback and such right no no take out the playback and dispose all right because unity will be doing that for us all right i was wondering because yeah i'm actually literally calling a create uh command buffer but yeah okay let's see if unity likes it somehow better All right, looks stable so far. Was that happening? I think it's. I think it just has something to do with that combination of like things being played back later in the frame versus like we had two kind of command buffers that were executing at different times, and I think that just okay. kind of caused some weirdness. All right. So now what I'm going to do is to change the run for a schedule parallel. Yep. And I'm just going to take some frames, and that's yeah. I think we should be done with the exercise, right? <laughs> Tim in the chat mentions this has definitely been a part of my experience with dots stuff just randomly not working anymore. <laughs> Facts. Yeah, I was either I, I was not executing my system either. The, sorry, the previous script either so that was not the reason either okay yeah so we are at let me try to find the right marker so the system is taking 0 0.11 milliseconds i can totally see the job system being super busy using most of my cores i believe and then yeah uh, actually, it seems like we gained a bit of performance, although not a lot. And we had about 0 0.30. Let me see another frame. Maybe we were just unlucky. So system plus, yeah. In this other frame, we had at 0 0.25. So yeah, that actually seems to be cheaper in general. Yeah. Sweet. There we go. I think at the end of the day, the important part is to check out the job, right? How uh, the scheduling looks like, right? Because right now I'm seeing a very efficient uh, way of using my course, right? I mean, it's still idling quite a lot, but you know, uh, it is now kind of green before we had everything like running mostly on the main thread. So, Oh yeah, I even see a job handle complete. So I guess there's some type of dependency there asking for the completion to finish. 
Yeah, and that'll be kind of um, what that add job handle for producer basically means. So when that, there's kind of a, a built-in system that runs at the end of the simulation system group, which is the end simulation entity command buffer system. Um, and when we do that dot add job handle for producer, it basically makes that, um, it, it sets up all the job dependencies, you know, for that NC command buffer on that particular system, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it makes so sense. That's, that's Although I am seeing this job. in my own system. So I'm seeing the job handle completely in my own system, not later down the road. So I would, you know, tend to think, why is it trying to complete this job like already oh, in my own oh, system oh. instead of just waiting for you know maybe in the feature or something so it might be that it's some type of dependency at some point yeah and that might be we could kind of do some things like you know moving the the main threaded guys to another script um mm -hmm. and kind of playing around with the execution order or something like that but yeah i think that would be more for another day yeah i think this has been already pretty but yeah i mean that that kind of is is basically you know the basics of that lod system that we wanted where um you know basically again we kind of started with this you know purely mono behavior approach you know just very simple you know distance checking enabling and disabling renderers um and then we basically optimized by creating these companion entities that um get instantiated alongside these different cubes in our world um, which can kind of take take uh take care of like the heavy distance calculations um you know do a lot of optimizations like that and then like literally we just look at you know what needs to change its renderer and um you know using uh using the the uh job or using the ecs we can kind of you mm -hmm. know filter out for what needs to change and um yeah change it yep and the gains are clear at least here in this machine yep Pretty good, man. Thank you, Johnny. You yeah, saved absolutely. the day again. <laughs> well, hey, um, I know there's still like a, a decent amount of people in here, but I guess maybe we can just kind of open it up for some kind of questions on this. I know we've been yeah, kind of going live for a while, but um, yeah, if anyone kind of has any related questions on here, maybe we can just kind of address those real quick before we uh, move on here. Going to change the layouts. Do not panic. Hit the mic again. It's going to take a while, I guess, for this layout to adjust. Yeah. I <laughs> couldn't wait, see wait. your screen the whole time. Yeah. Okay. So now I think we're good. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I see, I see us now. I think we're all, uh, we're all set here. Let's see. You see anything in uh, your chat? Let's see. I see someone that says, I'm a little scared to jump into dots. It's like a mental block. I'm afraid I'll waste a ton of time by heading um by heading a roadblock that i won't be able to solve this channel makes it all more reassuring hey <laughs> glad to help you out here yeah i mean i think it's um it's one of those things like i think yeah if you kind of watch this stream there's kind of like some little gotchas that we kind of ran into along the way and um you know just because i i have kind of that experience of like coding a decent amount with uh, the dots and ecs i can say oh you know that's happening because of this and that's happening because of this but you know, a, on a lot of those things, a lot of those gotchas that I was pointing out today, um, it it took like a lot of um, you know, banging my head against the wall <laughs> to try and like figure out, you know, what exactly was going on and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it, it's something that kind of does take experience. And, um, you know, I, I feel like, though, we are getting into uh, a little bit of a better state here. Um, I guess kind of along those lines, someone also asked when it says when dots 1.0. <laughs> um, I don't know for sure. Um, they they basically say they're kind of targeting the 2022 LTS cycle. Um, they've they've uh, you know kind of been on pace with the uh, uh, NT 0 0.51 update, which was just released last week, and um, uh, you know they said that they were kind of targeting quarter two of 2022 and they hit that you know just right at the end here so um you know they've they've been on pace with the uh 0.50 and 0 0.51 so that's been you know a good sign so far so hopefully sooner than later um looks like we do have all right let's see your eye uh so i messed messed with dots yesterday and one thing i ran into that i feel coerced into making 
uh, I job entity batch out of all my jobs. The type handle writing and passing is so time consuming. Any tips there? Um, I don't know. Have you tried using a I job entity at all instead? Um, if that might work for some of your systems, um, I job entity batch is, uh, it's something that I've kind of messed around with and it's cool, but I think, um, kind of I job entity is sort of the, uh, the new, the new kid on the block for that. But yeah, I'd say mess around with that if you can. Um, let's see, is anything coming in through on, on your chat? I got a couple more questions here on mine though. Yeah, you have someone saying thank you guys for informative. You're welcome. Have you seen awesome. this working on iOS and does it perform? Um, so I haven't done any really performance metrics because I, I don't really want to fire up my crappy Mac mini to make a, an iOS build of a game. Um, but yeah, so basically the the idea with dots right now is you know anything that can run the universal render pipeline can essentially you know run dots and and you will see kind of uh, performance gains um i know that um if you saw any like the the gdc presentations or or the streams that um i was uh, fortunately be able to be a part of um, there was this one guy, Jonas, his company, uh, made a game called detonation racing. And, um, this is a game actually for Apple arcade, basically built from the ground up with dots and ECS. And, uh, they did a lot of really cool things. And, um, you know, I, I definitely know that they had a lot of good performance results with, um, you know, deploying to, uh, iOS. So it went to, you know, um, iPhones, iPads, Apple computers, all that. So, yeah um so let's see question how would you go about implementing further optimizations for this lod system such as a native spatial partitioner um i don't know do you have any any kind of thoughts on how better we might be able to uh, expand the lod system well i think you can improve still on the alu or alu operations right you can make the distance square all of these things and yeah, it's still yeah. a very simple system right it is, you know, we have a hard coded distance, so we would need to extend on that. But I think that the biggest gains would come from actually um, knowing your problem very well, right? The more specific you can tie that to your specific problem, right? The better uh, the optimizations that you can actually make. To give you an example, the clients for which I was doing consulting, right? I required something like this. They were doing like, you know, recentering of the physics of the whole world to be, you know, around mm. the player, right? Yeah. Just to increase the accuracy of the physics. So uh, one thing you can do in that case is like, well, if you are going to be most of the time on the center, right? The player itself, instead of calculating a distance, just assume that the player is always at zero, 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 right? And then what you can do, I don't know, is maybe the distance is, you know, just checking if you are uh, at coordinate 10 or below or something like this, right? So what I mean is, yeah, you, you can do a lot of stuff when you know that you are tackling a specific problem. If you are doing some type of assets, I think that's the most complex part, right? Because you have to accommodate that for any kind of use case. So, and to be more specific about in general, I don't know, um, special, like special partitioning and such, I don't know, I would just need to read in on this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, and that's kind of good advice for, you know, all kinds of problems, especially, you know, data oriented ones. It's just, you know, really knowing what your problem is and um, I think the best thing, the best kind of advice that, uh, you know, I've, I've received and I could kind of give as well is optimize for the, the most, um, like the, uh, the most frequently occurring or yeah, most frequently occurring situation. So, you know, if, if you have kind of some edge cases that are not really happening all that often, you know, you don't necessarily need to, you know, tune your whole system to, um, you know, make it really efficient in that one particular case. Um, just, you know, really consider, you know, what is, you know, the, the state that the game is going to be in most often um, and, and kind of optimize for that. So that kind of goes back to like, you know, the, the debate of like, um, you know, tagging components versus flagging them. 
you know, if something is going to most likely be in one state most of the time, and it's not going to be changing state very frequently, um, then, you know, optimize for the case where, you know, you, you kind of filter out things by tag. Now, if you know that things are going to be, you know, frequently changing state, like every other frame, it's going to be maybe changing state. Um, then in that case, then yeah, it would probably actually make more sense to just, you know, have a, have a Boolean flag and, um, you know, you can go ahead and, and just check against the, check against the flag there. Sounds like wise words, Johnny. All right. Um, no more questions from my side. On my channel. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see. We've got a couple more here. I think we can kind of run through a few of these real quick. Uh, is it worth going into Unity's dots or go with a custom solution like uh, NTTS? I always butcher how to pronounce that. NTTS. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, it's a uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it's kind of one of those things. You know, really depends on your needs. If you're looking for like some kind of data oriented so solution, I think Unity's dots is a great place to get into. Um, I think the documentation is getting much better. Um, there are you know good resources like the Unity forums and um, my Discord community, tmg.dev/discord by the way. Um, that um, you know there are a good amount of people developing with it. I mean, it's not like as wide as it is with unity like you know how unity is whenever you have a problem you know you google it and like a thousand people have that same problem and you can find a solution to it relatively quickly um it's not quite at that level yet but um you know it is getting to the point where a fair amount of the problems that i'll encounter in dots i'll, I'll find people um online you know talking about so um, i think it's in a good spot right now and, and again you know something like uh the ntts i don't know i'm, I'm sure it's great i haven't actually used it um, but I would assume that the user base is going to be you know, much, much smaller than, uh, just regular unity dots. So that's just something to keep in mind. So yeah, I can't really comment on, um, you know, how it compares to dots, but, um, yeah. Also have to say that just taking the technical part aside, um, I would also consider if it was for important for you, right? For me, it would be important. I would also consider the career path, right? If I work two years with entities, for example, and I became the best in the universe at, at that, right? How would how helpful would that be for my future in terms of careers? Would I be able to go to a job interview and say, I understand entities and this is how it works and blah, 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 blah. Maybe some companies like it, but maybe some other companies tell you that's great, but we use dots here. So you are not welcome anymore. Now I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but you get the point, right? I would not only I, consider the technical. I, 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 I agree. I agree with you for the most part. I think that's really good advice. Um, but I feel like right now it almost seems like data oriented programming is like a little bit of a niche. So if you kind of have like any data oriented experience, like that's going to be a leg up on anyone who doesn't have any. Um, but of course, you know, I feel like the adoption for something like Unity Dots is going to be bigger um, for you know larger and more established companies than like NTTS. NT NTTS, yeah. NTTS. You, you say I think it, coming. I don't know. I, coming from Spain, I think it just sounds you know, NTTS, right? It just yeah, that's that's <laughs> simpler for me. <laughs> that's how I would. Well, call what it. are these NTTS? <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let's see what else. Um, let's see, uh, would you recommend investigating DOS to someone less senior and not yet pushing Unity to its limits or weight? Um, I'd say uh, in general, um, as of right now, if you don't necessarily need DOS for anything and you don't you know, have any interest in getting into data-oriented programming, there's, there's no real need for you to to jump in and look into it but um you know i think it's a ton of fun you know i really enjoy data oriented programming and um you know i i think it's great but yeah i mean if you if you don't have like any any necessary like use cases for it right now then um yeah just regular mono behaviors is totally fine and i, I generally recommend sticking with that um let's see
Ruben, are we going to collaborate on a course? <laughs> I actually asked him before the chat, before the live stream. I was like, Johnny, did you ever think about making a course on dots? Because I would honestly take it. I wouldn't pay for it because I will ask him for <laughs> to not to get it for free. But if I didn't know him, I would for sure pay for it. And uh, you know, jokes apart, I I kind of get it that dots is changing a lot. So it's a penny the ass to make a course and only for it to change a few. Uh, I don't know the next day or something that will be not that great. <laughs> but even as of today, right? As a performance consultant, sometimes the only way to go forward when you have an ultra low budget of 10 milliseconds or something like this, is to really get rid of a lot of these expensive mono behaviors. That's my opinion and my experience that sometimes uh, I wish I was you know, an expert on that. You know? uh, it is not that I cannot do stuff, I do it, but I would definitely still pay for a course, right? I told Johnny the other day, man, you had a lot of content on YouTube, right? But for me, it's hard to find the right path, right? The path, yeah, the no, right I get learning. it. It is a little disorganized right now, yeah. So to answer that partially, I would pay for a course, Johnny. And if <laughs> you're going to have collaborate <laughs> or not, uh, well, no, we didn't decide or talk about that, actually. I mean, we do some promotions from time to time, but doing course together, I don't know. Well, I mean, hey, just for the, the people who are, are this deep in this video, maybe I'll give a little a little tease on something coming up. Uh, don't have a course in the works right now. Um, I think maybe that might be something that I revisit uh, closer towards the uh, the 1.0 release of Dots when things are you know a little bit more kind of locked in place. Um, but I am working on a project right now that... Um, is uh I'm, I'm really excited about and i think um you know it is it is it definitely can be a good learning resource for a lot of people and um yeah i'll, I'll leave it at that and um i'm, I'm definitely gonna be talking about this uh kind of some more so just give you a little give you a little tease on that for now but um yeah I'm, I'm really excited about this project coming up i'm having a lot of fun with it i think johnny i'm going to spoil it <sighs> No, I, I, haven't even, I don't even, I haven't even like <laughs> told you all about what the project is. Uh, I'm joking. <laughs> all right. Any more questions? I guess not. Yeah, I think those are kind of uh, about all the, the main questions for now. Um, I mean, we've been, been live for over three hours now. So that was a, that was an awesome stream. Um, yeah. Thanks for Ruben Actually, for, uh, the longest kind of one. came up with this idea for the stream and um yeah i i had a ton of fun i think we went over some cool stuff i think i sure hope a lot of people um learned some stuff and got some good value out of it um yeah thank you all for showing up asking some good questions along the way um yeah you got any parting words here ruben what's up the fun it's the longest stream or live stream for me because i'm not used to do the long ones right but you know the fun kept me going. I will be maybe ready for another hour, but actually, you know, it's also 9 p.m. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready here. to eat. <laughs> it's uh, lunch time sure. for me. <laughs> ready to eat, ready to ready to sleep as well. So thanks a lot. I think that was cool. So hope you know to keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Again, thanks again for uh, tuning in, everybody. Uh, I do want to be doing some more of these live streams. I'm going to talk with some more people to do some other things. Um, maybe um, just kind of more kind of chatting about some things. But um, I think this live coding session was cool. So maybe we'll do something like this again. But um, yeah, thanks again, everybody. And uh, catch you in the next one.